We'll call this meeting to order. This is the Belfar meeting of the Belfar City Council. It's Monday, April 8th, 2024, and it's 5.30 in the afternoon. A roll call, please. Councilmember Sanchez? Here. Councilmember Santanas? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Denton? Here. Councilmember Morse? Here. Mayor Coops? Uh, here. All right, we're about to recess to closed session. We'll have Ryan read the items on the closed session. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we're going into closed session for one item, item 3A, conference with real property negotiator for three specific parcels. All right. I have a conflict on 3A. All right, so let the record show that Wendy Morris has a conflict on 3A, and she will not be participating. The rest of us are, will be participating. There are no one in the audience for public comments, so we'll now recess to, recess to closed session. call this meeting to order. Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Belfire City Council. It's Monday, April 8th, 2024 at 7 in the evening. Uh, we're uh, reconvening from our uh, closed session meeting where there were no uh, reportable actions. We'll have our roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Sanchez? Here. Councilmember Santanas? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Denton? Here. Councilmember Morse? Here. Mayor Coops? Here. At this time, we'll have our invocation, and I'll be providing that. That'll be followed immediately by the Pledge of Allegiance, and that will be given by Jim De La Longa, our Director of Economic Development. So please stand with me. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening hour to give you thanks for all the blessings you've bestowed on our city and us as people that live here. Be with us as we conduct this meeting. Uh, give us the with clear minds and right hearts to make the decisions correct for our city. We want to remember all those are our first protectors, our firefighters, and our sheriff deputies that work day and night to keep us safe. Be with us throughout the meeting. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please address the flag, put your right hand over your heart, and join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all you may be seated <coughs> <coughs> we'll have our council announcements now the city of bellflower is inviting entrepreneurs and small business owners to participate in the small <coughs> business kiosk program we have an exciting opportunity available to lease kiosk b located in downtown bellflower on belmont street this program provides a platform to operate a small storefront and to continue to be the growth of a pedestrian activity around the city. Apply now to be considered for this community program. For an application, visit the website at www.bellflower.org or stop by City Hall, second floor, to pick up a copy application, which are due on Friday, April 19th. Next, we'll hear from Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton. Thank you, Mayor. The City of Bellflower and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department have teamed up with Kaiser Permanente to host a drug take back um, event on Saturday, April 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Kaiser Permanente Bellflower Medical Office located at 9400 East Rosecrans Avenue in Bellflower. The collection site interest will be indicated on Clark Avenue. Local residents can turn in their unused or expired medication anonymously for proper disposal by the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. The event is free to the public. For more information, you can visit the website, uh, www.dea.gov, or also at www.kp.org. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. Council Member Victor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Bellflower. To help support local business owners, the City of Bellflower is highlighting mm -hmm. local businesses in its monthly eCitizens newsletter. Share business updates, special events, holiday celebrations, and more by emailing your information to economic underscore develop dev at bellflower.org. Again, economic underscore dev, D-E-V, at bellflower.org for more information. On business resources, please call 562-804-1424, extension 2010. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Council Member Sonny Sandianez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. The Bellflower Chamber of Commerce invites the business community to its Business to Business Casual Connections event on Thursday, April 25th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The Chamber will also be hosting its monthly morning mingle on Tuesday, April 30th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. For more information, please call the Bellflower Chamber of Commerce at 562-867-1744. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mrs. San Inez. Council Member Wendy Morse. Thank you, Mayor. The Fair Housing Foundation is hosting its 2024 Youth Poster Contest, which offers a chance to win the first pr place prize of $175. The contest is open to students in fourth through eighth grade. Students must create a poster on any size paper with this year's theme, Fair Housing, a place to call home. The poster submission must be in JPEG, PNG, or PDF, format and must be submitted to the email address cprado, P-R-A-D-O, at fhfca.org by next Tuesday, April 16th. For more information, please visit www.fhfca.org. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Morris. At this time, we're going to have a presentation and I'd like to invite Christina Prado from the Fair Housing Federation up to the presentation riser to accept the Fair Housing Month proclamation. So if my council colleagues would join me over here on the right, we'll present this. Right here, right here. Okay, perfect. Right in the middle. So as it was said, we've got Fair Housing more Month, and we have a representative here, Ms. Prado, and uh, this is the proclamation that I'm going to present to her. I'll read portions of it that I believe to be important. One of the greatest freedoms enjoyed by Americans is the freedom to live in a house or one's choice, and this year marks the 56th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act, the original legislation targeted the elimination of housing discrimination in America. And April is Fair Housing Month throughout the nation. We're asking each resident of the city of Bellflower to support efforts to put into practice the principles of freedom, justice, and equality upon which this great nation was founded. I, therefore, Dan Coops, mayor of the city of Bellflower, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Fair Housing Month as signed by Mayor Dan Coops, Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dunton, Council Member Wendy Morris, Council Member Sonny Sandinez, and Council Member Victor A. Sanchez. So this is for you, and uh, if you'd like to say a few words, it's your okay. turn. Um, so thank you to the City of Bellflower for presenting Fair Housing Foundation with this proclamation um, and for bringing more awareness to fair housing protections, rights and expectations for landlords and tenants. Um, so thank you all again for um, presenting this proclamation to the Fair Housing Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, public comments, Mr. Smoot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is the time set aside for the public to address the City Council on matters not listed on the agenda. Anyone wishing to address the City Council should come to the podium, be recognized by the Mayor, and state your name for the record. If you wish to address the City Council on an agenda item, you may do so by approaching the podium as we review that particular item. You'll be given three minutes to address the City Council. 
So the floor is yours. Anybody that wants to come forward, you can come to the mic here. And uh, if it's not an agenda item, you can certainly speak on it. And we'll listen. And you have three minutes. You're up. And, you, and mm -hmm. please announce your name and write it on the tab there and uh, your address. And we record all these testimonies. And thank you. What's your name, please? Uh, Oscar Villagomez. Okay. And I'm here. I met um, Dorian Smoot. <coughs> Further out. Uh, Oscar Villagomez. So I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm the new library manager for the Clifton and Brackensick Library. And so I'll be um, coming to the meetings monthly, and I want to share and highlight um, programs that we have going at the library. But for today, I just wanted to introduce myself and um, say that I'm excited to be uh, part of the Bellflower uh, community and I'm excited to get to know the community and everybody in it. Well, welcome. Thank you. Tell us where you uh, were located before you came to Bellflower. Where uh, so I spent nine years as the manager at the South Whittier Library. Okay. And uh, so what we'd like to have you do is you can come in on Monday nights if you've got a program or read to the kids or whatever event you might be holding. This is a forum that you could use to promote that. And we always will welcome you here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Nope. Good evening. My name is Gisela Gonzalez. I was here. This is my second time attending. Um, I was here back in February. <clears throat> and I was requesting um, some safety hazards down on Rosecrans. Um, and on Palm Sunday, the March 24th, my dad was actually uh, involved in a hit and run. I emailed um, some of you, don't know exactly, I got some cards last time. Um, and yeah, it's unfortunate. He's okay, he was taken to Long Beach Memorial. Um, he did suffer some fractures. It was, again, it was a hit and run. Um, I went the following day to the Sheriff's Department, to the Bellflower uh, Fire Department, as well as uh, the Bellflower Substation. Uh, just because they arrived so early, on, or actually really fairly quickly, um, I ended up out of, I ended up giving them some donuts, some coffee. But um, I wanted to share this because um, I wanted to put it out on the on on Facebook, and um, I was actually a little bit nervous. I wanted to be anonymous, um, but I think it was yesterday. There was another hit and run. Uh, I believe it was also in the city of Bellflower. So um, just wanted to see if there's. Anybody thinking um, of anything coming up on Rosecrans? Um, I said that there's some speed racing on that street, and sure enough, again, two months later, my dad was in a, you know, he was riding his bicycle, and he was involved in a hit and run. So. Um, Mr. Smook, could you address that, please? Uh I would actually ask Joel to address it if he could, but um, I know you've had conversations with, I believe, I believe, with Joel in the past, have you? Joel, our public safety director? Um, again, I was here in February. Right, so I, I, did, I, I mentioned it, um, but I didn't come in uh, the last month, so I wasn't sure how to follow up on that. I would offer Joel, our public safety director, right here in the corner. He's okay. the one that can get you connected with everything you need and any specific projects we have going up there. Okay. And Joel's right over here, and he'll be happy to talk right now. You can re approach him correctly. Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks for coming in. Anybody else want to give any testimony about concerns in Bellflower? It was all positive. We're going to work on the negative. But uh, thank you for the library manager to come in, and you're always welcome, as all of you are. But uh, Mr. Smoot, let's proceed. Eleven A public hearings. I believe this first one is Mr. Delawanga. Give me a second to get this up on the screen, and we'll All get right. going on this. All 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Smoot. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. The uh, item for, for you tonight for your consideration is the purchase of property at 16730 Bellflower Boulevard, the former Empower Building and Parking Lot and current office of the Chamber of Commerce. The subject site is located on the northeast corner of Bellflower Boulevard and Flower Street. It's composed of two non-contiguous parcels and is approximately 23,802 square feet in area. A 6,198 square foot building is on one parcel and a 29 space parking lot is on the second parcel. Both parcels are adjacent to the city owned public parking lot on Flower Street. In early March, the property was listed for sale for $1,995,000. A review of recent comparable sales in downtown Bellflower indicated the purchase price was within the range of fair market value. The city made an offer of $1,945,000 with an escrow period of 30 days, which was accepted by the seller. Included in the agenda packet is a summary report required by Government Code Section 52201 that describes the salient points of the acquisition. It is the city's intent in the long run to lease or sell the property to a business or developer that will establish a use that will contribute to the goal of creating a robust, pedestrian-oriented downtown with a variety of experiential and destination retail options. All proceeds from any lease or sale of the property will be deposited into the city's general fund. Staff is recommending the city council open the public hearing, take testimonial and documentary evidence, including receiving and filing a report required by government code section 52201, and after considering the evidence, adopt resolution number 24-16, amending the fiscal year 2023-24 operating budget to allocate funds for the property purchase and authorizing the city manager to execute a purchase and sale agreement, file number 422.1 in a form approved by the city attorney or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. That concludes my report and staff is available for questions. All right, let's start here with uh, Sunny. Have you any questions about this possible purchase? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Dolonga, for your comprehensive report. I <coughs> read the staff report. It's very, it's self-explanatory, and I think uh, we're, I'm really glad that we're taking this action to purchase the property, uh, especially, uh, I think that um, we have a good tenant in that property in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh. So anyway, my, my only question here is I want to see, uh, see clarification in terms of one of the actions that uh, we're asked to take today, tonight, is to amend the fiscal year operating budget. Uh, maybe staff can explain how much money we have in the property acquisition fund and why is it necessary to amend uh, the operating budget. So I have a testimony given by Mr. Tay Reed, our <laughs> finance director. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. So the general fund has about $3.1 million set aside for property acquisition. Um, it's not budgeted, it's just reserve set aside. And there's also $1.8 million in public projects fund that's set aside for property acquisition, and that's also not budgeted. It's just a fund balance set aside. So, uh, if you recall correctly, uh, when we did our budget last year, um, I think the directive from the from the city council was to set aside ten million dollars for property acquisition. Is that 10 right? Ten million dollars was for the contingency reserve, increasing from eight million to ten million. No, there was an increase in was it five million? Oh, five, five million. million five million. Yes. Five million. So, out of the five million, how much has been? allocated so far before this property acquisition? So $1.8 million was already used Spent for already. prior okay. acquisition. Okay. So $3.1 million in cash was, was set aside. Yes. Okay. So um, j just for clarification, so we're moving the money because it's not in the operating budget. So we're moving it from the property acquisition fund going to the uh, uh, operating fund. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. The fund set aside was just the fund balance reservation. 
Yeah, because I want to make sure that the public knows that we have money to buy this property. Yes. It was just a basic an accounting transfer from one fund to another. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Fick. Victor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tate, don't go too far. <laughs> no. uh, this might be a question for you as well. Uh, so just uh, one, of the, one of the items is the, if we were to sell whenever the development is ready or whatever we end up doing with this, the redistribution of the funds would go back into the general operating fund. Would that be earmarked again back into the cash reserve for property acquisition or completely the general fund? That's my understanding. It was just so, more like a revolving fund. Okay. It but would go back to the acquisition. But so it would go back to the down. acquisition. Yeah. Do we need to state that? And do we need to amend the resolution to do that? The, the council authorized $5 million in the general fund reserve to be set, set aside for future property acquisition right. or property acquisition in totality. So we'll maintain that balance, the minimum balance. In perpetuity? Perpetuity. And if we were to sell the property, though, would those funds come back to that account? It becomes a cash reservation. Right now, there is a combination of both pro property that we purchased before plus cash reservation, so totaling do, $5 million. So do we need to take a motion so that it comes back to the cash reserve under the property acquisition? We already took action with the budget no, resolution. I, I understand. Ryan, do you, do you get one It would entirely here? be up to your discretion mm -hmm. if that's – when and if you sold the property for some particular purpose, you could take action at that point. If you take action at that point? Sure. If, if I can just jump, wouldn't that be kind of automatic? Well, that's what that I was thinking. It goes back to the uh, property acquisition fund because the money was set aside <coughs> to buy properties and sell right. property. So it becomes more like a clearing account. Right. That, that's correct. Until we decide otherwise. It's already stipulated in the budget resolution that the set aside is $5 million, whether they're properties or cash. So, so it can never go over $5 million, is what you're it saying? It can. It can. Minimum is $5 million. Council can act, take actions. No, I, I think uh, Council Member Sanchez was just confirming that the proceeds from once we sell, if, if and when we sell this property, uh, the proceeds will go back to the Property acquisition fund. That was I, the question. I see. In the event it exceeds five million dollars, is that what no, you're no, saying? No, 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 no. Because right now any we have amount. we have any amount. we have three point one right now, right? right. We're going to be paying close to two million. Right. So the balance in the uh, property acquisition fund will be about one point one million. Let's say a year from now we were able to negotiate the sale of this property at the same amount, just for the sake of discussion. So that the question is, should, will that will the two million dollars go back to the property acquisition fund? Right. Crop, property acquisition fund is comprised of properties and cash. Yes, so it will go back. It will go back it automatically. Go back. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Just want to make sure. It, it's not purely cash or mm. purely property. Very good. It's just the way that it was mm. stated, general fund. It. So I just want to yeah. make sure that we need, if we need to make that amendment on the resolution or not. But it sounds like we're good. Yeah, you okay. made it very clear you want to at least find million. Right. Dollars. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Wendy Morris, any questions? Or I staff? do not have a question. Mayor Pro Tem Dutton. Are you guys clear with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clear as mud. Because yeah. the five thousand now is five million, or it can exceed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the direction of the little as I was reading the tea leaves up here, the direction of the council is to get it back in there. Right. It's like a revolving uh, account that you take us and you put us back in no questions okay so uh, I need a motion to open a public hearing so moved second so we have a motion by Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton seconded by Council Member Victor Sanchez without objection that'll be the order at this time I would invite the public to come forward if they have any questions on this project or have anything that we haven't discussed already or don't understand we're certainly going to entertain those questions Mr. Weehage you know the drill, sign in and state your name. Yes, I do. Honorable Mr. Mayor, council members, staff and audience, uh, I am wholeheartedly in favor of this resolution being approved. The chamber has uh, 
done very, very well in recent years. Uh, for those people that have never made it to the morning mingle, we had 86 people uh, at our last one, some of those people from out of town, and that's because of what they've heard from others. Uh, so I just want to um, let you know that I believe this is a worthwhile cause, and long after I'm gone, and that property is redeveloped into something much grander, uh, I'd like to see your fingerprints all over it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you speaking on behalf of the chamber or on behalf of Larry Weehage? Uh Chamber of Commerce. Okay. I do the car show. <laughs> no, I know you do. That's my I fingerprints. Think I need to, to my fingerprints are all here. over that you one. You may not have the support of all your colleagues on what you're saying. I just well, wanted trust to differentiate, me. you know? Trust me. Mm -hmm. Being a cop for 33 years, yeah. I yeah. got their support. Yeah. You may not you like it, but you'll get used mm -hmm. to it, right? Yeah. yeah, I've got their support. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Michelle, it's good that you're applauding. So, <laughs> <laughs> anybody else want to come forward on this project that we're discussing? Not yeah. seeing any. And move we close the public hearing. Second. All right. So you have a motion by. Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, seconded by Council Member Sonny Sandinez. Let's uh, please poll the council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, did without you? Objection. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Be the or <laughs> let's, without objection, that'll be the order. And now uh, let's go for the, the vote, unless there's more questions. You want me to make a motion? Well, I thought you had already. I was going to make no. it. Oh, All okay. right. Oh, no, go ahead. So we close the public hearing. Well, I can make the, you close the public hearing. I'll make the motion for, okay. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 24-16, a resolution authorizing the city <laughs> manager to amend uh, fiscal year 2023-2024 operating budget and execute a purchase and sell agreement file number 422.1 between the city of Bellflower and Empower Communications Corporation for the purchase of real property located at 16730. Bellflower Boulevard, APN 7109-013-800 and 801. I'll second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a motion by Council Member Victor Sanchez, supported by Council Member Sonia Sandianez. Please poll the council. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. Council Member Santanez? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dutton? Aye. Council Member Morse? Aye. Mayor Coops? Aye. Well, there goes two million. Well, that was eleven <laughs> B, Mr. Smoot. Mr. Delongo has this one as well. I have a conflict. On 11 B. All right, let the record show that Wendy Morris is excusing herself as a property conflict. Okay, Jim, you're on. Okay, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, we are request we're recommending that we. Ex uh, continue this item to April 25th. We would like a little bit more time to uh, look at this. We have, want to keep our options open, so we're uh, requesting uh, continuing this <coughs> item. A question to the attorney. Do we have to open a public hearing before continuance, if we go that way? That's my recommendation, just to make sure that if anybody was in the audience that wanted to address the council, they could on this been noticed. Okay. Yeah. Move, uh, we open the public hearing. Second. All right, so we have a motion by uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, seconded by Council Member Victor Sanchez, to open the public hearing without objection. That'll be the order. So, uh, if you've come here this evening for 11B to discuss our possible arrangements with the uh, Arieto Call Properties, uh, located on Flower Street, which is known as the U.S. Post Office, if you have any questions or want to uh, came tonight, uh, we want to make sure we hear your testimony. But if you're not here and don't want to give the testimony, we'll move on. But we just want to honor your presence. Not seeing anybody come up. Uh, I would like to uh, make a motion to continue the public hearing to date certain April 25th, 24. Should we, should we close the public hearing first? It says continue the public hearing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. we're, we're just moving down the road. Yeah. I'll second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion by Count, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, supported by Council Member Sunny Sandinez, to uh, move this to what was the date certain? April 25th? April, April 25th. 25th. Okay. Go ahead and uh, poll the council. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. 
Councilmember Santanes? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dutton? Aye. Mayor Coops? Aye. Moving on to 11C, consideration possible action for a public hearing. Mr. Smoot. I'll get oh. Wendy back in just a yeah. moment. <laughs> Almost forgot her. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and keep the trend going. This one is also Mr. De La Longa. <laughs> All right. You're, all, you're in your upright position. Yes. You're ready to go. <laughs> Good evening once again, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, the public okay. hearing Hold before on. you tonight. Wait a minute. Wendy's got an issue? Oh, I thought we were on 14C. I'm sorry. My bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, the public hearing item before you tonight for your consideration is an amendment to the Bellflower Business Assistance Plan, adding two new programs to the plan, expanding the restaurant and retail assistance expansion and modernization of programs citywide, and to consolidate Chapter 3.1 into one citywide facade improvement program. In July 2022, the City Council amended the Economic Development Business Assistance Plan, adding three business assistance programs the Designated Block Downtown Facade Improvement Program, the Downtown Artisan Small Scale Manufacturing Rental Assistance Program, and the Small Business Microloan Program. The overall plan is organized into chapters, which makes it efficient for staff and city council to assist businesses and property owners to help with the city's economic development efforts. Tonight, staff is recommending adding two new programs to the business assistance plan, the Downtown Restaurant Assistance Program for Regulatory Requirements and the Chamber of Commerce New Business Welcoming Program. In addition, the business assistance plan guidelines were reviewed and minor updates made, most notable of which are the expansion of chapters 2.1 and 2.2, the Restaurant and Retail Assistance Expansion and Modernization Program, which makes these programs available citywide instead of just focused on the downtown. Also, the consolidation of, the, of Chapter 3.1, which is, was the Downtown and Citywide Facade Improvement Program, and we're consolidating those into one citywide program. And that's going to have consistent loan amounts between the two, whereas previously it had higher, lo higher loan amounts for the Downtown, it's now going to have the same amounts for the entire city. We also added some minor flexibility in the loan matching requirements that are part of the program. And so now I'm going to go over each of the new programs. Program Edition 1 is the Downtown Restaurant Assistance Program for Regulatory Requirements. We call it Chapter 2.3. This program is intended to help maintain the success of existing businesses that in some cases may have expanded too quickly or have been challenged with unexpected federal, state, or local government requirements. In such cases, the city's assistance is necessary to ensure that otherwise successful businesses do not prematurely close. Chapter 2.3 allows the city council to grant not more than $20,000 annually to successful downtown dining establishments that under the threat of closure for failure to adhere with federal, state, or local regulations as to sales tax would have closed. Under no circumstances will the city grant more than a total of $100,000 to any individual grantee. Among other requirements, the grant will immediately terminate if the grantee closes the business for longer than two weeks, doesn't stay current with ongoing quarterly sales tax payments or any previously arranged payment schedules with the Board of Equalization, or if the outstanding sales tax debt is satisfied by other means. Applications will be selected for City Council consideration by the Economic Development Department based on the completion of the, of the application and the required attachments. All applications will require final approval from the City Council. Program addition number two is the Chamber of Commerce New Business Welcoming Program, or Chapter 6. This program, in partnership with the Bellflower Chamber of Commerce, leverages public and private funds in an effort to provide practical resources to the Bellflower business community to encourage economic growth citywide. This program offers reimbursement to the Chamber of not more than $220 for the cost of each new business's first year of membership based on the business's number of employees. 
The program also includes a new business ribbon cutting grand opening ceremony planned and carried out by the chamber staff for qualified participating businesses. The program will be implemented through a memorandum of understanding with the chamber. Both programs are subject to available funding as determined by the city's current budget, which has a two year funding of $885,000 for the business assistance plan. And that was included in the city's operating budget for fiscal years 23, 24 and 24, 25. Staff is recommending the council open the public hearing, take documentary and testimonial evidence, and after considering the evidence, adopt resolution number 24-19, or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. This concludes my report, and staff is available to answer questions. All right, Wendy, we'll start with you. Ms. Morris, have any questions? Um, well, mostly because I'm new, so this program was never available to the entire city. It was always just the downtown area. Correct. For the for the chapters 2.2 and 2.3, mm -hmm. it was only specific to the downtown to try to boost up the downtown as a whole. And as that has gotten momentum, we're looking at now expanding that citywide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dutt. No questions. Mr. Sanyanez. Mayor. Uh, Mr. DeLonga, um, part of these uh, provisions, there, there are some provisions that says that, um, for example, let's say on page 15 or 27, the business or property is sold or transferred before the three-year loan amortization period ends, winning balance of the loan will be due upon sale or transfer. So from a practical perspective, what can we get out of it? Interestingly, council member, when uh, Fantasy Cakes sold their business, uh -huh. they paid back their loan. They did? Oh, they okay. did, yes. Okay. Was uh, that an exception? Um, well, that's the only case that we've had so far. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, that's good. Yeah. So we, got a good, we have a good track record. Um, the second question I have is on the, um, um, this may be requiring some kind of correction. Oh, can you put the previous slide? Um, the one before this. One more, one more. There you go. Okay. So I know that, um, so we're talking about the grantee doesn't stay current with ongoing sales tax payments. And in the staff report, I mean, you, you, you're more elaborate in terms of your example on this. I'm just kind of concerned that um, are, are we perpetuating the business not to pay their sales tax? so that they can get a grant from the city. So I'm playing devil's advocate here, because if they can get $20,000 from the city, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be paying my sales tax and apply, apply a, a grant from the city so I can get them $20,000. This is for sales tax debt that they have accumulated already. And the they language. have to but stay um, current with their uh, existing quarterly payments that they have to continue to pay. But my point here is, any business that makes sales they know that they have to remit the sales tax to Sacramento. They know that. So I'm just concerned that we're kind of perpetuating this. We're almost like encouraging them not to, pay this, not to remit the sales tax so that they can apply for a grant from the city. I'm just kind of thinking from a different perspective. You know, I, I, li I like the idea of providing assistance to business, but I, I don't think this is a right way. I know we've done this. I don't think it's the right way to, to encourage business because it's an expectation for them to remit the sales tax that they collected from the, from the customers. That's their obligation. I'd rather use the money for something like there's a regulatory, uh, new regulations. For example, let's say, throw me some ideas here. Let's say uh, a restaurant, there's new requirement in terms of exhaust, things like that. They cannot emit any more or trash collection, something new that uh, will be burdensome on the business owners, uh, they might close the business un unless they get a grant from the city. I'd rather do that instead of this because to me, this is an expectation of, of the business owner to remit the sales tax that they collected. So I'm having problem this with this, with I'm having issue with this provision. I'm all for gi giving assistance, but I think we're, we're doing it the wrong way. Mr. Mayor, if I might, 
Um, two things with this particular program. Number one, the grantee must be in the rears at least $100,000. In other words, they'd have to not pay $100,000 in sales tax in order to get a grant of $20,000. And, and even upon application, there's no guarantee that they would get the grant from the city. It's a discretionary action by the city council. That'd be a pretty big risk on behalf of a business to do that. So I think those two provisions do provide some security in that regard. But, but why, we why would we uh, kind of let them, let them do that, go that far behind? That means they're not business savvy. If they're that far behind, again, it's, it's my, 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 my pet peeve here is it's not their money. They're collecting the money from their customers, and yet they're not re remitting it to Sacramento. And here we are. We're coming to rescue them. That's, that's, I'm, I'm having an issue with that. If it's something that is a new regulation coming from Sacramento, coming from OSHA, and the business is going to be uh, adversely affected, yes, by all means, we need to support the business. So my recommendation is if we can take that out and still allow for business assistance, but not for, not for the sales tax. It's to me, it's a problematic. Because again, we're almost like encouraging them to, to be delinquent. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Let me defer to the city attorney. I see the wheels are turning. Do you see any ticklers we could put on this loan that would not allow them to abuse it? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's a policy question about whether you want to go down this particular road. I do remind the council that, for example, with the microloan program, that has had less than optimal success. So I'm, you know, to the council member's point, uh, ta sales tax is supposed to be collected from the customer in order to be remitted to Sacramento. So there really, on the face of it, should be no reason for anyone to be in arrears at all with regard to sales tax. It's much like transient occupancy tax. Transient occupancy tax is not paid for by the business. It's paid for by the customers that are attending the business. So from that perspective, it's obvious that if you're actually that much in arrears with regard to sales tax that's owed to Sacramento, you're actually dipping into the till of tax in order to pay for your operational expenses. So to answer your question, yes, of course I can put lots of, of tentacles within the agreement and make sure that the city has all of its, its uh, all of it, all the arrows in its quiver, so to speak, in order to recover the money. My observation on that is a wise man once told me that you can't get blood from a turnip. So I mean, if if the bank if the the entity is bankrupt in any event, there's no way I'm going to be able to recover the money for the city if their their operations have not been above board in in the first place. But again, it becomes a policy question: Are you able to right the ship by infusing cash? at that particular point in order to make ends meet for that particular customer. And that's a pure policy decision by the city council. Now the examples we have had where there has been an individual who was behind on their sales tax collection, they're to the point where they were within days of losing a very important part of their activity, liquor license, for instance. So that would indicate to me that had we not, if we were to provide money to pay the tax to get to reserve their liquor license, mm -hmm. they were within days of losing that. Could we use, be, I'm trying to figure out a way where you would be to the point where you are, you would have to almost close your business in order to qualify because, as you said, this is discretionary. We can determine whether or not an individual will be awarded this money when they ask for it. But So it's not a given that we have to provide it. Is that true? Or if we do it for one, we've got to do it for everybody. And to answer your question, Mr. Mayor, you have to accept the applications from anybody that qualifies on paper. Whether or not to actually grant the money, that's a separate question for the City Council based upon the circumstances being presented by the applicant. So you, it's not a ministerial action whereby somebody files an application and immediately they're, they're provided a grant. It's like any other grant program. Folks, there's a limited pot of money. People will file an application. You have to accept the application from anybody that's qualified. And then on a case-by-case -case basis, the city council will make a determination whether to grant money and how much 
if you decide to grant money, how much money to grant. So there's no, th and, or at all, um, you don't have to grant any money. So it's, it's purely discretionary from that standpoint. If we were to ask them to provide financial statements or income tax forms, would that have any merit on whether or not we'd be right, making the right decision? Or do we have that per privilege? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that's already part of the application requirement. Oh, they would have to. That is what would be expected. Correct. And, and if you co recall, I, I go back to the microloan example simply that because that's the most recent example that I can think of off the top of my head. You had those materials at your disposal and went through two or three meetings uh, discussing it with the applicant. So it's, it's something that the council's gone through before. And again, it's a, it's a purely discretionary decision on behalf of the city council whether or not to grant it. Even if there was a demonstration of need by, by the applicant, there's still no requirement that the council actually grant any money. We're talking about the $35,000 one, correct? Correct. And that had no tentacles on it as to what that money would be used for other than to operate our business? I had very specific items within the agreement in terms of what was required. We had liens on much of the equipment. Again, though, it comes back to blood out of a turnip. All right. Is, but what we're discussing tonight is simply a way to provide assistance on sales tax. Nothing. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mayor, what if, what if we, if I may. Go ahead. Um, I think hearing uh, Council Member Sonny Ness comments, I think there's some validity there. What if we were to remove some of the language that focuses it on sales tax. I think he hit a couple of points. There's a lot of regulations, a lot of new things coming through the pipeline, but what if we were to just leave it as a downtown restaurant assistance program for regulatory requirements and then have criterias that are meant not necessarily to focus on taxes or tax debt or anything like that, and then we can assist or assess every case or every application that we may get. Quite frankly, uh, like the director said, we've only had, we've had these programs available, different kinds of these programs where we have funding available to assist new businesses and so forth. We've only had a couple of applications. So, you know, I think we always fear the, the um, flock of people coming in to apply for these programs. They don't because, let's be honest, there's so much requirement, so much paperwork, so much time to have to deal with our city attorney and so forth like that. But I think we can actually simplify it a little bit answer Sonny uh, members' uh, comments, and, and then assess the applications as they come. That would be my recommendation. Sonny, do you agree with that? Well, that was my recommendation. All right. <laughs> yeah, but, but don't include the sales tax, omit that entirely? We're almost encouraging them not to remit the sales tax because we're specific on that particular grant. So why not make it open to, let's say, regulatory requirements, you know, things like that, anything that, that will cause the business to fail because there are new requirements. And totally exclude the sales tax. That That's my, my recommendation because it's, mm -hmm. it seems like we're trying to, don't pay your sales tax and ask the city to, to, for help. I mean, that's how I see it. Again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Dutton. As one had been collecting sales tax for 35 years in a business, it's like a general fund. It goes in the same pot. And I imagine 35 years ago when I started out, your monthly sales tax is due or whatever. And then you have a trip. You have an employee that got in a crash in your company car. You have a major something that just happened. And now the new thing is you have smash and grabs in your business. You've got to replace the whole storefront. It goes into a general fund, and it's there. And it's the intention of the business owner, he knows he has that sales tax debt. And you have ongoing things that you do not foresee until you get ahead of the game. And we're talking about businesses starting up here. That's why we're helping them. Um, when somebody starts a business, they think they have enough money, they never do, unless they got a great inheritance to start. Um, it's hard work, it's long hours. I lived it, and Dan, I think you lived it too. You know what I'm talking about, being the other retailer up here. Um, 
it doesn't matter what you loaned them. And I, I see what it, I understand, guys, what we're talking about. It looks like it looks bad. It's not bad when you're on the other end of it as a business because every business owner doesn't want to fail. If they fail, it, 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 it's like cutting their guts out. It's, it's, it's the humility. That's going, and, it, and a business owner will work extra more time. Yes, there are going to be bad apples out there that are going to you know, take the, the system to their advantage. We can't stop that. We just had it last year. Somebody did it to us, $30,000. Um, we can put all the checks and balances in, but um, I think we ought to leave it the way it is, just being a retailer. So I'm gonna, that's my advice is, is living it, living it. Wendy, have you something to say? Um, I, I understand the thought process of when you are s starting up a new business, and like you said, it's a general fund, and sometimes stuff happens, but if you can somehow manage to balance that out, like, like Sonny said, you don't want it to be a free, well, just don't pay your sales tax. But Jim, you answered it when you said they can't, they have to stay uh, up to the to the point of the loan, they can't default on their taxes, correct? Sales taxes. Correct. The, they'd have to continue paying them. Okay. And so I guess that would be the, you got the leg up, but you have to stay current. Mr. Mayor, if I may, yes. I want to comment. I want to be very clear. I am very supportive of this kind of program, especially the fact that we're going citywide um, on that program. And I, and I think what I want to say is that I, I think we're adding more flexibility by removing the fact that it is sales tax language. So that means that in any case scenario, especially newer businesses and stuff like that struggling, I think removing the sales tax component would give us more flexibility to actually utilize these funds and put it in where we want to, which is economic development. That, that so I wanna, I'm very, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, I, I hear, you know, the challenge, especially with smash and grabs and stuff like that, we've been fighting that and, and, and going to Sacramento and advocating for, for more public safety on that, but that's a whole different topic. So I understand those different concerns that could come up, and I think that's specifically why if we were to remove the sales tech component, it gives us more flexibility to make more decisions down the road. Just, that's the way I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like we're enhancing it, actually. Mr. Mayor. Yes. If I can, because uh, my concern here is, is really targeted towards sales tax. 2.3. Yes. Sales tax. And Council Member, that your example, if, if someone was um, affected by smash and grab, things like that, why can't we assist the business owner, let's say, to buy new fixtures, to replace the window if there's no insurance? I'd rather use that money to basically bring them back to where they were before they were, before they were attacked by, by smash, as an example, instead of, instead of the sales tax. Okay. That's what I'm having issue with. Right. Or or payroll. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that we can uh, we can assist the business owners to get back on their feet. But I believe sales tax is the thing that can put them out of business quicker than anything yeah. else. I, you know, a broken window, a smash and grab may inflict real damage on the resiliency of the business. But if the sales tax people say we haven't received their money and we're going to revoke your your uh, sales tax license, you're done. There's no turning back. And so. We're trying to put something in place here, I believe, that it's the worst possible scenario. And it's true what you say, that we, we could have it abused. And I like to think that the retailers would not do that. But I wouldn't try to give them a pass on their sales tax, but I can't imagine that they would plan to take advantage of us on the sales tax by foregoing that and then claiming that they had need for that money. If we, we're sensitive to the, business operators in Bellflower. And most of them, they're members of the chamber and they're in town. And I have a habit of wanting to give them the benefit of the doubt. Whereas you're looking for a way for them to take advantage of us. Well, be because uh, it, it, it's going to be codified. I think we, we handled that to action by the city council. But codification it as part of the business system program to me, then it becomes part of our regular activity. And we're just opening it to everyone. That's my concern instead of opening to more, more, more uh, opportunities for us to assist them. We're very, we're very targeted towards sales tax. 
and that's why I'm having problems. Well, we can still the system in other ways other than the sales tax. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I'm for that. Right. I'm for that. But I, like I like to be, have it more enhanced. I want to add to it. I don't want to take away from it. That's why I'm in support of the idea of underwriting the sales tax, if it need be. That's, I'm talking along like Dutton. I've lived and died with, you know, <laughs> been in the stores that, you know, you give it all you have for two or three years, and when you fail, you don't just fail in your business. You fail psychologically. Yeah. You fail with your family. I mean, I have had friends that fail in business that have never recovered from it. They've ne they lost all their confidence. Um, and I don't want to put anybody through that possibility uh, of not being able to succeed. And if the city has a program that allows them to participate, I'm going to try to believe that they're doing the right thing and not trying to take advantage of the city. But if we sense that they are, as been suggested by the uh, city attorney, we have the discretion to be able to say, no, we can't help you. If we feel as though that this is not the correct way that they're conducting themselves. But anyway, I think we've heard that enough. I'm mm -hmm. going to take the yeah. public comments and we open the public well, hearing. Mr. Mayor, to right. chime in some more. I, right. If I might, yes. okay, go ahead. Uh, provide a little bit of context as to why sales tax was looked at in the first place on this. Uh, to your example, in the circumstance where a business perhaps is behind on their sales tax and they have some sort of licensure from the state, the state can say, um, we're going to take that licensure that has value and sell that, sell that asset off. That might kill that business. What it does to that particular business is only one piece of it, though, because that, let's say a liquor license, for instance, um, if, if, a, if ABC comes along and takes that liquor license and sells it off, it's going to be far more difficult to put a liquor license back in that location in the future. ABC is going to take that into consideration. Um, from the city's perspective, if we want to keep a business going, it's not just about that single I individual business. It's also about the ability to keep that particular business use going into the future as well. That's why this yeah. type of regulation was considered in the first place. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dutton, you had something to say? Yeah, so since 24, about two and a half years ago, I brought floated the idea of trying to help in Golden Corral coming out of COVID. And you know how my colleagues know how long this project's been mm -hmm. going on. They, they haven't got their help yet. Um, I mentioned why are we helping everybody downtown Belfar Boulevard? Every other restaurant got help. They can't even trim, your Golden Crown can't even trim their, do their landscaping. Well, why don't we give them some money? Well, after about a year, am I right? It took a year we come up with a plan. Trees are still growing. They're trying to do what they can to trim them. And it morphs into, well, we're going to change the landscaping. We're going to do this. We gave them a grant, $20,000 to get plans drawn up. And goes out to bid. Now they, they got to pay half of what they get. They're getting estimates for $50,000. Well, we're going to give them 20, half of it. They got to come up with twenty five, But nobody wants to bid on it because it's a, a, a prevailing wage project and it's too small for those kind of companies. And to this day, two and a half years later, we can't. And that goes in hand. And so how quick is this assistance? Is this like a 30-day quick? quick? This could, be, day? this could be pretty quick once the council mm -hmm. uh, approves yeah. somebody for this program. So if somebody just had a car driven through their whole storefront and they boarded it up, how long would it take to get their windows back on a program like this? Well, that's different from the sales tax program we're talking about mm -hmm. because right. then that would require them getting a contractor okay, to get that prevailing, prevailing wage. wage. See? Yes. Uh, that's where I was going with it, Sonny, when you mentioned that. And anything else they wanted fixed in the building. Well, it's <laughs> my, my point here is if, if you want to assist more, I'd rather give more money yeah. to them. Yeah. See, my, my, see my, my biggest concern here is is that... They'd be out of business before they no, got no, the they're, money is They're what collecting saying. the money that is not theirs. <laughs> that's, not, that's my biggest issue here. They're collecting the money from the customers and they're not remitting them to the state. Mm -hmm. They're using it for some something else. Mm -hmm. that's and they that, got behind, just that, like that's, people that's do their taxes. That's the biggest issue. I'd rather because help you, them somewhere else. Because of the business, else. you have other priorities and uh, expenses to stay in business. Right, exactly. Hoping I'd to catch up them. later. Let's say incre increase the amount for landscaping, for example. I'd rather do that. Well, a business is going out of business. You ain't going to need no landscaping. <laughs> 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 it, it doesn't, it's just, to me, it doesn't make sense the way I've been wired for 35 years operating a business. Take it for what it's worth, guys. All right. Let's uh, open the public hearing.
I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. All right, we still have a motion by Council Member Victor Sanchez, supported by Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton. Without objection, that'll be the order. So you've heard the discussion, public, as to what we're discussing here on sales tax relief, and uh, we'd love to hear your input if you've got any. Any business owners out there? Yeah, or... Uh, <laughs> Larry, you always got something to say. Say something. <laughs> I'm going to sign in again just to yeah. keep up with the ditto marks. But you're sensitive to the uh, how to run a business, even though you no, got you one. know, I, I was in law enforcement for 33 years, and uh, what I did is totally uh, different than what. Uh, you two did, and um, and certainly different from what uh, Councilmember Sonny Senez did with all the millions of dollars that he dealt with. Um, I think uh, all of you have some great points. I think you've got some great points. Okay, so if a business fails, and the city loses some money, but what do you gain? What do you gain? You've learned a lesson. You know how to adjust to make things better, maybe to fix some loopholes. You're not out $200,000. You're out twenty, thirty thousand, whatever it is, but you've learned a great lesson. And so my belief is we want to do everything we can to keep the businesses in business in Bellflower for as long as we can. And whatever it takes, even if you lose a few rounds in this long 15 round match, you learn something from it. And I think that would be very, very helpful. And with your ability to say nay to some of the businesses, uh, I think that would be uh, the way to go. My two cents worth. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Larry. Anybody else like to speak on this? Gio, you're a businessman. What do you think? I'm going to call you out here. <laughs> I'm going to sign in. And your best penmanship. So, it's been two years since I've been here, and we start with this. So, I understand what, where, where Sonny's coming from. And I'm not sure Sonny ran a brick and mortar store. But when you lose a business, you lose more than a business. You lose another door. It's like missing a front tooth. When we smile, we have all our teeth. We're going to have one with a cavity. But once you're missing one, it makes the other ones fall. So when somebody's not going to pay the sales tax, 99% of the time, is sunny. they took the money to fix the window with their general fund, and now they don't have money to pay the sales tax. The number one reason a business closed from the government standpoint, especially with a liquor license, is the sales tax. And when you get a revocation on your sales tax permit, you're done. And it's, the do it's a major domino effect. So I agree with what you're saying. It doesn't make sense on paper. But I do agree with what with, with, with Ray's saying is that when somebody's coming for that, it's very hard. And I think the idea what you guys did here, I, I don't know. It's been here two years since I've been here. But I think what you, you guys accomplished is how to give money out without other government restrictions. The easiest pathway is saying sales tax. And now when you give that business that money, one, it does, it keeps them there. And if a lot of you guys are in the retail space, we're losing. Being a business owner, we are like the dodo bird. We are going into an extinction list. Everyone is trying their best to close us down, not trying their best to keep us open. So where I do agree with you, Sonny, and on the face of it, it makes total sense. But on the government regulations, it doesn't. Because the easiest way to loan money is saying, I can't pay my business taxes. I actually took the sales tax money that I saved to save the, an employee, a, my door, my window here. So please give me assistance on this point. So <laughs> that's my employee asking, can you borrow $20,000? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> what, 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 what I do believe is I think your guys are, your, your heart's in the right place. Help business owners. We are, we are a dying breed. 
it's hard to open a business. And when they're asking for assistance for taxes, not necessarily that you're going to lose them. And keeping the guy open one day longer keeps the other two guys on both sides, their doors open too. That's it. My, my two cents. Thank Sorry you, you called Good me job. up. No, well, that's, I'm glad for the testimony. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Seeing none, I guess we can close, close the public hearing. Move, move we close the public hearing. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, supported by Council Member Wendy Morris to close the public hearing. Without objection, that'll be the order. All right, so uh, I think we've had this discussion now. We kind of know where we're all at. Does anybody want to make a yeah, motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, before you make a motion, okay. I just want to kind of um, clarify again that we're all here trying to, to assist businesses. That's the bottom line. I, I think where we're differing is how to do it. No, I, I agree with that. Okay. And um, using Gio's example, I'd rather help the business owner fix the window help payroll instead of the sales tax. That's basically the difference. Okay. Right. I we're, understand. We're the same path, so. All right, so uh, Mr. Dutton, you've made a motion? Not yet. Oh, okay, <laughs> I thought you were, and, okay. Uh, oh, excuse me, you got it. Uh, no, I, yeah. well, that was only one, one okay. aspect of yeah. the business plan. There's another one. All right, so the, the part where uh, we uh, partner with the chamber. Yes, on, exactly. Yes. Do you want to have discussion on that before? Right, right. Just, just, just for color, clarification here. Yeah. What can't you like about that? No, I <laughs> love it. <All> right. <laughs> <laughs> you're putting you're putting words into my mouth, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> I love the program here, but just clarification, Mr. Dolonga, on um, on B three. Uh, business must own their business location or have an existing lease with a minimum of two years. So if they have a lease, why will a draft be, uh, be, uh, be needed? The draft of the agreement? That would be if they're a new business about ready to open. As a, a, if they don't have that lease, if they're in the works, at least then by the time they get to opening, they'll have a full lease. So you, you make a good point. I'll look at that language. We can adjust that language and right. You just kind yeah. of just kind of doesn't make sense because they have an existing lease already, and then why why, why there will be a draft? So it should be a valid lease at that point, right? Understood. Okay. Okay. If you can just clean yeah. it up, and also um, on number four, uh, the property owner is required to submit confirmation on their receipt of rent. Why is rent? Why is the rent here? Typo. Oh, typo. Okay. Right. I, I want to yeah. make sure that we're not encumbering the Chamber of Commerce yeah. for <laughs> work that they, they, they don't have. You know? <laughs> I want to make it easy for them. And the same thing with number five. Uh, cannot sell or assign the business without approval. Once we, get, once we give them the grant of 220. We're just being strict. It becomes a moot point, right? We're just ha trying to add some teeth to the program. Oh, okay. I want to make sure that uh, whatever we do here is kind of enforceable. If not, then okay. And then on C three, is this a requirement that it, it creates one full time equivalent job? Correct. It's a requirement. Yes, it is because uh, we're doing this through economic opportunity, and okay. one of the main things for economic opportunity in order for the city to spend its funds for that is job creation uh -huh. is okay. one of the main requirements. So that's why. Okay. Even though it's a very small amount, we'll still require uh, at least one uh, a job created for this program. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's good. And uh, j just just to explain this this program, uh, I think it's a very great program because it will give uh, the new business owners coming to the city a free membership with the Chamber of Commerce. And I, I think that will come a long way in terms of our continuing partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. That was very good, Sonny. <laughs> Mr. Sanchez, <laughs> anything to comment? No, I think uh, I have no comments. I I, I, I agree with uh, Sunny Santinez. Uh, item five just seems unnecessary, but um, section B five. That's just my my Thank two you. cents. Yeah. Wendy, have anything you want to offer here? Nope. Mr. Dutton. Nope. 
I want to explain how this is going on here. <laughs> when you uh, come to City Hall and you want to open a business and you want to get a business license, um, you also are, are invited to go to the chamber and become a chamber, chamber of commerce member. And there's a fee over if, to get a business license. And, of course, there's a fee for becoming a member, an annual fee to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. What we'd like to do is when we vote on this is that if you come to City Hall and you want to draw for a new city business license, you will be g given uh, a pass to able to have a new one-year Chamber of Commerce membership. So that would allow you to have a grand opening put on by the chamber, and the council will still support and come to these uh, grand openings, and they will be in the grand opening business of when the new merchant requests it. But more importantly, the chamber will be able to expose to that new business owner the benefits of being a chamber member without any exposure of their own money. So I expect the chamber, through that first year, would invite them to the mixers, and uh, the, the mingles on the last uh, Tuesday of the month and all the other programs that are available as a chamber member will be able to sh be shown to that new business owner. And hopefully after the first year, they'll say, hey, this was a great uh, invention here. I want to stay a member. And it sh hopefully will grow the membership of the chamber, which is a vital, vital part of our community. So that's what we're kind of discussing here. And uh, we're just getting working the kinks out. But... It's a great program um, we, to show that the city is in partnership with the chamber and in ch allowing us to underwrite the first year of their membership. So that's the story. <clears throat> that was well said, Mayor. Did yes. it make sense? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, actually, one quick question. All right, go for it. For Mr. DeLonga. Um, have you predetermined the name of this program? Are you going to go based off of what you're calling this chapter, or are you going to brand that differently at a later date? Just curious how so you're going to. This was what I came up with with on the spur of the moment to get it into the plan so you're, you're going to work on the branding i, I can if that yes if that's yes, a recommendation okay. i'm hearing it's a recommendation, it's a recommendation. Work on the, okay all right oh i i i well i you have something in mind <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to put myself on the spot but okay uh you know you know i i think that it's great we know what we're doing you said it eloquently you know what the goal is it's exposure to the chamber it's exposure to the community it's exposure to you know, why the chamber is important, right? Um, I think that it's important that the program, as we present it, it's the city is helping you get on your right foot right at the get-go. So I think it's not necessarily the Chamber of Commerce welcoming program. It is the city of Bellflower welcoming program, and here's what you you get when, when we welcome your new business, right, into this community. And part of that is you get a free membership to the Chamber of Commerce. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just branding. It's it's our program, you know, just like you did with, uh, uh, I won't say it, the Belfar Connect, though. I'll say it quickly. Apparently you don't like that term either, right? No, I like that Oh, one. okay. <laughs> and that's it, you know, just you know, just my two cents. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And Jim will take it under advisement. He's a, a marketing expert. <laughs> All right. Did we close the public hearing yet? Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Now let, we're getting to the point where we're going to uh, look for a motion on this. Uh, Sonny had a question that's been answered, or a statement, I think, about how he still loves everybody, and yeah. so we, we've got and that. The chamber. <laughs> <laughs> and the, yeah. There's no, yeah. There's no part. malice in his heart. So. <laughs> you want to make it? Yeah. Oh, your your turn if you want to make a motion. Make a motion. That was pretty simple here. I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt resolution 24-19. That's everything that we've all talked about up here, guys, for for catch-up reasons. <laughs> With the uh, caveat that our uh, economic development department will uh, get a cool name for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have a motion on the floor. Do we have support for that motion? I'll second. All right, so we have a motion by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, supported by Council Member Wendy Morris. Please poll the council. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. Council Member Santanez? Um, I'm in favor of the new business welcoming program, but I don't want the uh, sales tax bailout, so I abstain. Mayor Pro Tem Dutton? 
Aye. Councilmember Morse? Aye. Mayor Coops? Aye. All right, we got that one squared away. Moving on, that was C. 11D, Mr. Smoot. A lot of business tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna ask Travis to uh, run the slides for me on this one, but I'll be taking this item. Um, I'll item 11D uh, before you this evening is the first public hearing to gather input prior to considering the placement of a measure on the November ballot for voters to decide whether Bellflower should become a uh, charter city for the purpose of exercising greater local control uh, over our local affairs and to protect the character and quality of life in our community. <coughs> so as you are well aware, this is not a new issue for Bellflower. It's one that um, to which a significant amount of study has been devoted over the last few years. Uh, this process sp here specifically started in 2019 when the city council appointed a committee comprised of a cross-section of your community from local business people to the Chamber of Commerce to local religious leaders and residents, um, as well as two council members to consider this issue and make recommendations for you and consider language and bring that back to you. After holding um, multiple public hearings and soliciting feedback from residents for all of the reasons that I'll go into in a minute here, uh, the committee drafted the proposed charter language and recommended that you consider putting it before the voters at the right time. Go forward, Travis. Thank you, sir. But I think it's helpful to take a small step back and um, understand some of the context that's led to this point and understand um, why we might be considering a charter in the first place. There's two types of governance structures for local governments in California, the first being general law cities, which Bellflower is currently. Um, <clears throat> general law cities derive their powers from the state's general laws and are subject to, the st to state action and all of the limitations they're under, regardless of the subject matter under consideration. Um, they're, they're limited to exercising only the powers that are specifically conferred to them by the state constitution and by the state laws as seen fit by the legislature to adopt. Um, whereas charter cities, on the other hand, derive their powers directly from a local ad ad charter adopted by the voters in their communities. And they maintain uh, power over lo local municipal affairs. And those powers are guaranteed um, in the state constitution for charter cities. So as a charter city, uh, Bellflower would retain local control over traditional municipal affairs, for example, planning and zoning and land use considerations, public works projects, uh, municipal contracting, the procedures for that contracting, economic development programs like the ones you've just considered, um, public safety and local law enforcement, whereas traditionally matters of statewide concern would remain with the state. Those are things like school system regulations, regulating traffic and vehicles, uh, licensing for professional, uh, professional licensing for engineers and the like, et cetera. Um, it's also worth noting that if Bellflower were to adopt a charter, it'd be joining other Gateway City neighbors like Downey, um, Cerritos, Long Beach, Whittier, and Signal Hill that all, have all made this conversion at some point in their history. So when we talk about maintaining authority over local municipal affairs uh, and keeping, the, keeping that authority in the hands of our residents here in Bellflower, we can see that some of the benefits of having uh, a local charter can provide, including some of the following. Um, increased efficiency over our, the management of our government finances. Um, we can establish local priorities and procedures for contracting. Um, <coughs> we can increase flexibility to select contractors and select qualified contractors based on more than just the lowest price available. Um, a local charter would help us to reduce overall costs by eliminating the requirement to pay prevailing wage, which we've had some uh, discussion about this evening for certain projects and for services, while also, as the language has been drafted by your committee, uh, maintaining some prote protections for prevailing wage on some of our larger uh, traditional public projects, like street improvement projects, for example. But importantly, um, to the example you had in the last instance, there's um, some projects in the city whereby the example uh, Councilmember Dutton used, whereby the landscaping bid that we received uh, was 
prohibitively expensive simply because we had to pay prevailing wage for that project. Under a charter, the prevailing wage requirements for that type of project may not apply. Uh, having a local charter would help us address homelessness and build uh, housing affordable to our residents and by allowing more control at the local level, more input from our residents and more decision making in the city council's hands. D decisions like uh, densities, affordable housing requirements, et cetera, could remain uh, here, be made here in Bellflower instead of handed down by the state. Um, specific projects can be tailored to better fit into the overall character of our community instead of being mandated for size and scale by the state of California. And the city could maintain its ability to focus on our local priorities uh, here in Bellflower, like crime prevention, quality of life, public safety issues, and keep that long-term decision-making in your hands and in the residents' hands. Um, also, the city could identify and enforce quality of life, life regulations that directly affect residents' day-to-day -day lives. And there is some pending uh, legislation at the state level that would add additional powers in that regard as well. Um, and I mentioned the um, flexibility with economic development programs and reduced costs of those programs for prevailing wage. I think that's an important point for us with the number of economic development programs and projects that you all do here. Uh, overall, the adoption of a lo local charter would help to keep the power to make decisions here at the local level instead of uh, at the state level. Um, and allow us to be to provide the services that our residents rely on more efficiently and effectively. But ultimately, uh, this is not a decision that is in your hands. Um, it's not a decision, or it's a decision that has to be made by the Bellflower voters. And I'll say that no decision's been made to place an item on the ballot um, as of now. Um, we're simply here tonight to uh, gather input from the public, and uh, we're asking you uh, to one, open the public hearing, take, uh, testimony and documentary er evidence from the public and after considering that evidence uh, provide us the direction to go draft the necessary documents and come back to you at a se second public hearing on May 13th where um, we would we would ask you whether you want to go forward with this process alternatively you can give us any direction you so choose happy to answer any questions all right so that completes your report it does any questions of uh, mr. Smoot um, Sonny, are you up and ready? Uh, no question, Mr. Mayor. All right, Victor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my first question would just, uh, what decisions would remain within the state legislature? Because we, state legislature, because we know that not, not all would fall under local control. Yeah. So um, this, the California Constitution lays out things or lays out that uh, charter cities maintain control over what what is traditionally considered municipal affairs. There's some question as to what constitutes municipal affairs and there's some things that are relatively clear. Um, land use decisions would stay here. Um, your public works projects and the contracting for those projects would stay here. In fact, you'd increase your ability to set the procedures by which you contract. Um, your economic development programs that you have currently, you'd be able to expand and adjust accordingly and perhaps save some money through those processes. Um, and your public safety decisions, of course, remain local. Things like um, school regulations uh, are traditionally state affairs. Licensing and registration for state, state licenses would remain with the state, et cetera. Uh, traffic and vehicle code amendments would remain at the state level, for example. Would be the same. Yeah, would like be ex exactly the same as currently. Whatnot like that, okay. Impound. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit as to how do our like neighboring cities, for example, Downey, Cerritos, Long Beach, Whittier, how do and Signal Hill, how do they respond to SB nine? How do they respond to state mandates for for more flexible development in housing? And is that because my understanding is that those still are pretty much mandated, just like they are now. I think there has certainly been some challenges to those provisions. In fact, there are charter cities that are challenging whether those items are uh, matters of statewide concern. The legislature has stated their intent that they are matters of statewide concern, but there's some question as to whether they are. The, the city attorney can answer that more specifically. So Mr. Carl, uh, Mr. Berger, what I heard there is anything the state deems matters of emergency, state emergency, 
it can basically overturn whatever our charter says or the, whatever the charter would say if, if, if and when the, if the voters were to pass it. So, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the state legislature likes proclaiming that things are of statewide importance. And the state legislature can certainly adopt legislation stating that this particular piece of, of the legislation is of statewide application, including charter cities. The legal reality is only the California Supreme Court can make the determination of whether or not something is actually of statewide application. And the most recent example of that is actually on prevailing wage. The California legislature made the proclamation that the issue of prevailing wage is of statewide application, and the California Supreme Court said, no, it doesn't apply to charter cities. And so the reaction to that from the state legislature was to say, okay, well, we acknowledge that California Supreme Court has said that uh, application of prevailing wage is not of statewide application, but if you, the charter cities, don't enact prevailing wage requirements for certain public works projects, you're going to be ineligible to receive state money for those projects. And so it's a, it's a stick and a carrot approach from that standpoint. So to answer your question, yes, of course the state legislature has adopted many pieces of legislation in recent memory with regard to housing and what have you, where it's proclaimed within the legislation that it's of statewide application. None of the cases challenging those pieces of legislation, however, have made it to the California Supreme Court for that court to make the determination of whether or not it's actually of statewide application. So in response to your question about what surrounding cities have done with regard, if they're charter cities, I think for the most part, other than the ones that you read about in the news, uh, they have quietly acceded to the state legislature's determination, but that doesn't mean that it's a legal mandate um, and I haven't read each part of, of the ordinances that those, those cities have done or have, have adopted to make that determination, but that would be the legal reality. Thank you, Mr. Berger. I, the reason why I'm asking these questions is because it, I, 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 obviously there's pros and cons, and I think there's more pros to it, so I want to be clear to my colleagues that I do support the concept of this. I, I just don't necessarily want to portray this, you know, amazing image that this is all of a sudden going to solve all our problems that we, you know, talked about, when in reality, there's still going to be challenges. Uh, you know, got to manage expectations here. The reality is it won't solve all our issues. It'll help us in certain ways. It'll give us more tools in the toolbox, but it won't necessarily, you know, solve everything. And, um, and I just would not want the residents to think that when, if this, if this, if this goes to a ballot, um, to think that, oh, all of a sudden the city of Bellflower has got it figured out and everything's going to overnight turn and it's going to be a beautiful, I mean, I want it to be beautiful, don't get me wrong, uh, you know, I think we're always working, always working towards that, but I think it's just important that we um, educate, you know, and I think that's going to be the biggest challenge with this. Um, I didn't sit on the board or on the committee or anything like that, so uh, I read through the, um, the proposed charter uh, as it's written now. Are we looking at amending or are we looking to, well, I guess that's a question for my colleagues, um, are we looking to amending or are we going to propose it if proposed in May, when is it, when would be the meeting? Uh, tonight we're just asking you to just take public us. testimony. The second, we're asking, we would ask you to schedule the second public hearing for May 13th. So May 13th is our deadline to know whether we're doing this or not, essentially. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, so it, it, if I can just address one of your comments. You're absolutely correct. There's no silver bullet for trying to maintain as much local control as possible. That said, uh, perhaps the concentration should be not on the gray areas of where the charter powers may lie, but rather on the clear benefits for charter powers. For example, Mr. Gorecki can tell you that uh, on a weekly basis at least, we have discussions about uh, moving forward with particular public works contracts and whether or not prevailing wage needs to be paid on these and whether or not this contractor qualifies or that contractor qualifies. Uh, and the reason for that is because those are all determinations made under state law, not locally, state law. Uh, as, as the city manager mentioned, your whole discussion about the business assistance program, well, one of the key factors in that is every single grant agreement that we issue, if the council issues grants, 
states in there that you must pay prevailing wage. And the reason for that is because the Department of Industrial Relations has stated that if you provide subsidies to economic development, you must pay prevailing wage on that. And if you're a charter city, those particular projects, as the charter has been drafted thus far, you don't have to pay prevailing wage on. Uh, so perhaps the answer to your question is concentrate on the clear areas of law where the charter absolutely controls and then make the observation with regard to the areas that have not yet been determined by the California Supreme Court that this is the best argument to try to combat against the edicts coming down from Sacramento with regard to some of the things that perhaps the city council is in the best position to make a determination on. Affordable housing, land use, all those types of things. The people of the city of Bellflower elected you to make those determinations, not the folks up in Sacramento. Um, so that, I'll get off my high horse with regard to that and answer your question with regard to the charter draft. The charter draft was crafted by the charter committee and the city council considered it several times in the time that uh, came out of committee. So it's really up to the city council about whether or not you want to make amendments at this point. But to answer your question, yes, the best time for that to happen is up until May 13th. Give direction today of, of whether or not you want to move forward and then make your final decisions on May 13th. Yeah. Yes, sir. While we're talking about the charter document, if we're, if we're in this goes through and Belfleur does turn into a charter city, is can that charter document be amended? Uh, yes, it can. It would have to be amended by the voters of the city. Oh, okay. It's by the city. Okay. It has to go back out to get amended. Okay. So it's a document that's got to get close to <laughs> close to right as possible when it goes through. Okay. It, I was, it, I was Mr. hoping you would say, it, I'm sorry, uh, hoping you would say like by a four-fifths vote <laughs> or something like that. I, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, one of the reasons that the charter is so short is exactly for that reason. It provides you the general outline of the way that the city government should be structured and empowers the city council to adopt ordinances in order to implement it. I see. Oh, got it. So it's broad. Wendy, did I ask you if you had anything to comment? I don't at this point. And that was your comment? Well, well I had another one, but that one popped up and kicked the other one aside. I got to wait till <laughs> I get him back over here. Oh. <laughs> My question is, what are the, say for instance that you are given instructions to go forward to place this on the ballot and the ballot measure passed, what are the mechanics of changing from the general city to the charter city? Is that a big lawn out, drawn out affair? What do we have to engage another attorney? Can we use what we have? What are the mechanics of how that would go forward? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'll handle that one. I, really, it would be seamless. There would be really no change because it's the charter is dra as currently drafted is a city manager form of government. You have the option of either continuing on, for example, with a contract city attorney or with hiring a, a, an employee as a city attorney, which you have right now. Uh, all the things that the government, current government has would remain in place. The real key is say, let's say six months, a year down the road from after a charter were to be adopted, the types of ordinances that the city council would adopt in order to implement the charter, specifically with regard to contracting or with regard to prevailing wage or with regard to uh, land use, all those types of things. But those are all within the, would all be within the authority of the city council to make those decisions. But if the city, if the city charter were adopted by the voters and approved, it would take effect in December of this year. And afterward, really, the question becomes implementation of that charter by the city council. Okay. For example, if you were to amend your contracting procedures, for instance, we'd have to bring you back an ordinance change in order to do that. And so we notify policy. the state that we've changed the way of doing business here. And they've got a scorecard somewhere, apparently, so that when we do something, they say, no, they're, they're exempt from that. Or, or do they check on what the different cities, how they're conducting business, in relation to what the rules are in Sacramento. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it, the S Secretary of State and the state certainly would be informed about the change in the governance structure of the city. 
But beyond that, we don't seek permission from Sacramento for the types of ordinances that would be implemented. You would simply Im implement them. And then the question becomes, is the state going to challenge them? And some of our neighbors to the south and west of us have already experienced that type of, of interaction with Sacramento and with the Attorney General's office. Uh, Bellflower is not traditionally taking on those types of battles, and I don't imagine that it would in the future. But certainly it would give you the opportunity to do things that are certainly beneficial to the community, again, with, uh, and I'm concentrating simply on the areas that are clear with regard to a charter, contracting, economic development, prevailing wage, all those types of things are certainly well within established law about what is a local municipal affair as opposed to something that is a uh, requirement from the state uh, from the state of California. Thank you. Yeah, I remember what I was going to All right, my other thing. So a few, three or four statements ago from the city attorney, he mentioned about how the public works is getting tied back and tied down from agreements and contracts or whatever. And what I know is what I think you were saying is it seems to streamline staff's time to get things done faster. You all as the city council can certainly establish more streamlined yes. procedures than what we currently have. Well, yeah, that I would get that is it's, it's time because we got to go by Sacramento's rules, which is six steps. We go by Bellflower's rule, maybe three steps. That's where I'm going. At. Yeah, Things certainly. get done faster. Everything I've been on since I've been on this dais, it takes government so long to get things done. It drives me crazy because the private sector, as everybody knows, gets done quicker. And anything to speed up City Hall is a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If we've all spoken our piece, then uh, looking for a motion to open the public hearing. I'll make that motion to open the public hearing. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, supported by Council Member Victor Sanchez, to open the public hearing without objection. That'll be the order. So you're invited forward now to uh, give testimony. Cheryl, we're glad to see you. And uh, if you got an opinion, we'd like to hear it. Let me sign in. He was on the committee. You're part of the committee, so uh, you bring I some was. history to it. <laughs> Now, what I would, as council, um, mayor and chamber or council members, I would like to recommend that prior, I, I certainly do hope it gets onto the ballot in November. I think it's a very important move for our city. I'm kind of prejudiced on this, I guess, since I was on the committee. But in light of that, I would like to see our, our, con our residents educated on what the differences are, what we would gain by becoming a charter city, what it would mean to them, because I would imagine 95, well, I don't want to say that, maybe 75% of our residents have no idea. I learned a great deal. I, I do have a master's in public administration, so I know a little bit, but I learned a great deal about the charter city and what it gains a local community and I would just like to really encourage educating our public in whatever ma manner you might recommend or decide is best so they can make a knowledgeable vote on this whether they vote yes or no that's up to them but I need that I would love to see them know what they're really voting on and not just go and mark the ballot okay right, thank, thank you, you. Anybody else have any comments about Charter City versus General Law Cities? Seeing no win, uh, we can uh, close the public hearing. Nope, yep. Someone's nope, going to the somebody's chair. Gonna, oh, thank you. Yay. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Elizabeth Alski. I'm your account manager with SafeBuilt. And I just wanted to ask a clarifying question because this conversation topic is fascinating. Um, as it pertains to charter cities, it was mentioned that it would impact land use. Uh, so in particular with Assembly Bill 68, which requires the allowance of ADUs or junior ADUs on any lot, would it potentially give power back to city council to regulate in your jurisdiction for that topic in particular? We'll let staff respond to that because it's an yeah. important question. 
<laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I, it goes back to the brief discussion about who can make a determination of what's of statewide application. And certainly within the past four years with the numerous bills that have been coming out of the state legislature with regard to affordable housing, which includes the ADUs, JDAUs, housing element, empowerment of certain agencies of, of the state, empowerment of the attorney general and what have you. All of that is new legislation and has, I, I don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head whether or not that legislation has been challenged by a charter city or not. There are various challenges right now, especially out of Huntington Beach that are in the trial court system, but those have not percolated up to the California Supreme Court. And so again, I can't give you a definitive answer because we don't have a definitive answer yet from the California Supreme Court. Uh, certainly the California legislature's position on it is, is well known. Uh, the attorney general's position on it is well known and the governor's position on it is well known. But at the end of the day, the only ones that can make the determination of whether or not a charter city is actually affected by those regulations is the California Supreme Court. Uh, that's a very lawyerly way of saying, I don't know, but this is our best <laughs> argument. <laughs> Well, it's certainly a fascinating topic of conversation. No, that in itself would be a reason to go charter cities. We could <laughs> control on that, you know. It but definitely it, piqued my interest. The jury is still out in more <laughs> way than one, so. But I appreciate your question. Thank you for the clarification. Uh -huh. All right, we're going to try again. Anybody else want to give testimony? They're certainly welcome. All right, Not seeing anybody. Move, we close the public hearing. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton, supported by Council Member Victor Sanchez, to close the public hearing. Without objection, that'll be the order. So moving <coughs> forward here, do we want to authorize the city to go forward with the initial uh, idea of seeing what's necessary to make us become a, possibly a charter city, or would we leave it alone? Yeah, I'll chime in. <clears throat> Make a motion to direct staff uh, to draft the necessary documents to add the city charter ballot measure to the November 5th, 24 election ballot. Okay, we have wait, a second. Wait, wait, are we... Can you repeat that? Um, are you saying we're making a decision today to put it on the ballot? No, we're going to do no. it on May 15th. We're just drafting. Yeah. This is the dra okay. draft to draft the documents to, to proceed because we still got another public hearing. Yeah. Could we could we take before we make a motion or before we vote on something? Can I just chime in and throw something out there? Sure. There's no second. No second yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Berger, um, with regards to Section 4, governance and elections, um, uh, I believe there are cities out there that have in their charters um, or even by resolution uh, means in ways in which uh, the body rotates its vice mayor and its mayor positions. Would it be possible for us to see some language samples for the next, set, uh, for the next meeting? Because I believe that this charter should have something along the lines of that. You see what, uh, and I don't mean to talk publicly about neighboring cities, but we've seen issues in other cities that have charters, and I think that'd be wise for us to address it, and and possibly amend a bit of the uh, the uh, the charter, and that way we can get it right 100%. All right, we have until the May 13th to do that. Right, right. So I just want to make sure that we're giving direction to staff to come back with some language. We'll come up with some some. Uh if that's what the council would like, we'll come up with some proposed language or some examples of, of, yeah. of what you might Yeah, bring want. some examples back. No, we'll try to get it right the first time because I don't want to have to go back out on another election. Yeah, it's costly, 175000 mm. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll if, if with that amendment, I'll support the, okay. the motion. Yep. All right, so we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dunton, supported by Council Member Victor Sanchez, mm -hmm. please poll the council. Can we clarify the motion quickly? The motion would be that uh, we will um, go forward with this 
but in the next month we will be able to contribute to the staff ideas on what we want to do to amend the current charter possibility and to include uh, elections and uh, offices held by the council members in other cities and how that would apply to our, our charter city possibility. And to schedule the public hearing for the 13th? Yes. Thank you. Did I get it right, Victor? Yes, okay. sir. All right. So uh, please poll the council. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. Aye. Oh, wrong guy. Council He's Member. <laughs> He's very excited. He's so anxious. <laughs> I'm trying to streamline things. Yeah. <laughs> Can he just vote first all the time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Council Member Santinas? Aye. Mayor Potendon? Aye. Yeah. Council Member Morse? Aye. Mayor Coops? Aye. All right. 13A consideration items. Mr. Smoot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm waiting for my computer to open my document here, but uh, I'm going to start this item off and then I'm going to ask Beth to answer some of the technical questions related to this item. Um, <clears throat> and I think they're running the slides from that end again this one. So if you would run them for me, Beth, thanks. So the property in question on this item um, is the one you see here um, at 15240 Lakewood Boulevard, 9030 at a 9146 Somerset Boulevard and 9215 Flora Vista Street. Um, this is a site, approximately 22 acres, formerly a golf course in the city in open space. Uh, it's currently under lease to Hollywood Sports Park as an outdoor recreation opportunity uh, for our residents and residents of the surrounding areas, in fact, quite a wide surrounding area. Beth, if you would, slide. Uh, as background, uh, the existing lease to Hollywood Sports Park is a 25-year term with options for the tenant to uh, extend that at their their desire. The first opportunity for them to request those extensions is in October of this year. Uh, the history of this site um, and these conversations has been somewhat of a long one. Uh, this site is currently under consideration by Metro for potential uh, placement of their maintenance and service facility uh, here in Bellflower. The City Council initially expressed uh, its opposition to the maintenance and service facility siting at this particular uh, location and the reasons for that were concerns regarding uh, the lack of open space and other other uses of the site or uh, throughout our community. In 2018, however, the city expressed uh, the very specific conditions under which the city council could consent to Metro's acquisition of that property and conversion to the maintenance and service facility. And I've listed those. It's a little hard to read on the right side there. I've listed those conditions out for you. Um, the first one is essentially that the uh, maintenance facility fit in with the surrounding, the surrounding uses in the area. Uh, the second one is that the Metro establish a Bellflower First hiring policy when they're staffing the site. The third one is that the purchase price for the property be based off of fair market value and be sufficient to offset replacement open space somewhere in the city. And importantly, the uh, fourth condition there is that the establishment of the rail facility at the site uh, would offset the required 3% match from the city for the station also proposed to be located in Bellflower. This is some context um, that I think is important to keep in mind as we're considering future uses of the site, including the existing use. Um, last year, you conducted a resident survey in which 81% of your residents identified a lack of affordable housing as a very or somewhat serious problem facing your community. 82% identified the number of homeless individuals in the city. 73% identified gangs and juvenile violence. 59% identified the number of vacant buildings. And 46% of people identified a lack of public transportation in the community. And I provide this just as some quick snapshot of context as you're considering future uses of this site, of what your uh, residents are thinking. As we have discussed in your last item and many times, uh, the state of California has determined and I think we all recognize that there's a significant regional and statewide need for housing that's available and affordable to various income levels, in not, not only in our community, in many communities. Um, in our local plans, we've also recognized a significant need to maintain and create more open space in Bellflower. Uh, as through our RENA process, Bellflower was allocated 
the need to plan for and potentially build 3,700, north of 3,700 housing units by 2029, which you've done through the adoption of your housing element. But importantly, the state also, through one of their new legislative pieces, has adopted what's called a no net loss provision. In other words, if you hypothetically um, zoned a particular site for 100 units of housing and then later on approved a project for 80 units of housing, you would then have to go offset that 20 units and rezone another property to allow for additional 20 units of housing. So when you adopted your housing element, you included a certain amount of buffer units to, to mitigate some of that impact so that if you, if in the instance you approved something, say, less than what was potentially allowed there, you, you can make up for that no less loss provision. If the city council were to consider uh, housing on this site, you'd be bolstering that buffer a little bit and bolstering your ability to, uh, to maintain projects that fit in with your community and consider those projects on a case-by-case -case basis. So in order to consider all of your options on this, process, on this property, the city uh, is considering a general plan amendment and a zone change uh, for this particular parcel uh, to rezone the site. <coughs> and by doing so, you maintain the ability to meet the community's uh, most pressing needs, which is why I included some of those uh, polling numbers for you from your residents, the, the needs that they identified as important to them. The rezone of this property would allow for alternative uses in the future to include mixed use, such as high-density residential and open space, and importantly, would also protect the existing tenant and their ability to continue to operate. Um, the a rezone would address the priorities of your residents for affordable housing units and housing that's affordable to various income levels across the board, and would assist the city by bolstering that buffer that I mentioned. Uh, it would also secure the, the city's ability to maintain open space and recreational opportunities if you so desire in the future. And again, importantly, it would maintain the existing protections for the current tenants at the site. Now, while there's no specific project identified for this particular site right now, and I think that's worth noting, the city's considering this as a program EIR to uh, consider this future use down the road. And with that, I'm going to ask Beth to go into some of the technical aspects of what this process would look like if you want to consider this going forward. Thank you. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. So as the City man Manager mentioned, um, because there is no specific project, we would be doing a program EIR, a Program Environmental Impact Report. The first step in that process is to issue a notice of, of preparation and that notice is sent to various stakeholders and the public, and it's meant to inform them that we're preparing this zone change and general plan amendment. And the purpose is also to seek public comment on what should be addressed in the scope of the EAR. A scoping meeting is also held during the NLP process. The city has an existing agreement with DUDEC for consulting services related to CEQA review. The completion, the preparation and completed, completion of the notice of preparation and the scoping meeting can be accomplished under the existing agreement by task order. Following the completion of the NLP and the scoping meeting, the city can work with DUDEC to develop a more accurate cost estimate to complete the program EIR or seek additional proposals as necessary. So for the recommendation tonight, it's to authorize the city manager to release the notice of preparation and execute a task order with DUDEC for preparation of a program environmental impact report or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. And that concludes the presentation. All right, thank you. Very well done. Wendy, have you any questions on this project? All right, Mr. Dutton. No questions. How about Mr. Sonny? Uh, no question, Mr. Mayor. All right, Victor. Yeah, what? You got it all. <laughs> you get all their time. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not good. Um, okay, uh, just two questions, actually. Um, one, 
um, I- I explain to me a little bit about the, the arena numbers. I understand that in 2029, 2030, we'll have to go through the process all over again. So most, more than likely, there'll be a new allocation of numbers. When we're doing this modification, because we've already submitted our arena numbers, we've already been approved, that's already been established. Would this um, reallocation, in the sense of by re, re, in a way rezoning it or doing, are we doing that tonight? We're not doing that tonight, right? We're only looking at notice of preparation for Correct. the EIR. But can I ask, so can Carl, Mr. Berger, may I ask further down the line, as we're looking at this, and this were to be added to that arena goal as a, as an area, would those numbers of units apply to it, that future allocation? Does that question make sense? Because I, I don't I wouldn't want to see us have to, you know, let's say they allocate another four thousand. Right. You know, uh, you know, we've just allocated a, the biggest piece of open space in our city, right? So, I think it's important to note here that. Um, what you're doing, what you would be doing by uh, rezoning this property to allow for a certain number of housing units is you're bolstering that buffer number. You're not affecting your existing uh, approved housing element RENA numbers that uh, HCD has bought into already. Okay. We've identified certain sites in the city that can accommodate the, uh, the necessary housing that we're required to build. What we're saying is over and above that, we think that it's worth considering this location for housing units as well to boast, bolster that buffer number. Provides you a little more flexibility down the road as you are considering projects, but it doesn't add to your arena number. Got it. So regardless of whatever the EIR comes back with, let's say it comes back with the ability to do X and Y, it would not, it would not support, or it would just be a buffer. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, just to be clear, the EIR is only the the environmental impact right. of any potential project. So, hypothetically, if the council were to move forward tonight by authorizing the task order to be issued and authorizing a notice of pre preparation to be pr drafted and issued, what would happen then is that the consultant would begin the process of reviewing what a project might be. A project might be taking that 22 acres zoning it up to a certain density. And then what the EIR would look at is, okay, what are the effects of that project on the environment? And in addition, the EIR would not only take the desired project, but it would also look at alternatives. All right, and I, again, I'm throwing out hypotheticals. Let's say your zoning would allow up to 1,000 units on that piece of property. Well, the EIR would look at the effects of that 1,000 unit project, but it would also look at a 750 unit project. It would look at a 500 unit project. It would look at a 400 unit project. It would look at the no project alternative. Once the council and the pro and public have that information in front of it, you can then make the determination of, well, do you want to move forward at all with a reason? Do you want to move forward with all the amendments being proposed and what have you? And those are all legislative decisions that the city council would make in the future. And so what we're really looking at in terms of processing things, you're looking at a minimum six months from the time that the notice of preparation is issued until the time that there's a, a programmatic EIR in front of you for consideration. And then you still have the legislative decision-making process to go through in order to make a determination whether you're going to move forward with, with rezone or wh whatever you want to do. Uh, so I think... No, you absolutely answered okay. my question. I'm just, you know, one of the, the my goals is to understand not only the the step that we're taking, but what the ultimate end goal would be and what how that would implicate, right? And I understand that we, those are at later conversations, but nonetheless, it's still important to kind of understand where we're going. Right, and and to the city manager's point, you have a certified housing element. Right. Right now, the state is satisfied that count that the city can meet its arena numbers or has sufficient land to meet the arena numbers. The reality is, is that there's no city that I'm aware of or county within the state of California that has ever met its arena numbers, ever. And it's unlikely that will ever happen in the future. But these numbers continue to come out. There is legislation pending right now, uh, which would require greater transparency in terms of how those numbers are calculated, because right now it's a bit, little bit of a mystery. Um, but one of, I was just discussing this today with, with an official about uh, the potential of actually understanding how those calculations are made. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, going back to one of your earlier questions about if we have land allocated for the future, for the next process, the next cycle of rain and numbers and calculation and spending lots of money to put together the housing element, we at least have this buffer, as, as Mr. Smoot has referred to it, not only for the present cycle, but for future cycles. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, let me just, let me just add to, to uh, Council Member Sanchez's concern. Uh, the arena numbers we have right now, it's cast in stone. They cannot change it anymore. 37, 35 is our obligation to 2009. So the next cycle may change, again, depending on how we calculate the arena numbers. But that's the ninth cycle. But for, nine, for the eighth cycle right now where we were in, it's done. We're done. They cannot do anything about it anymore. Okay. Um, Beth, could you put up that uh, the requirements that the city made of Metro if they were to construct a service facility there? All right, so written on the right-hand side there are th what was written, what was that, 2018? That's correct, that's Resolution 1864. So when the city was contacted by Metro MTA, they indicated that other places that they would like to put a service yard for their train, Belthar was one of their favorites. And uh, they considered Paramount as well, but they liked what they saw in Bellflower. And we wrote at that time that these are the reasons or the elements of the agreement that we would like to have you be aware of and adhere to before we would consider making a deal. And uh, so I, I think it's, we should probably explain to the public that there have been some overtures made by Metro to use that as a service facility and why we're doing what we're doing. Can you address that, Mr. Smoot? Yes, there have been uh, discussions with Metro, in fact, for a few years now. And in fact, their um, final EIR for the Southeast Gateway line uh, is out on the street uh, at the moment and will be considered by the Board of Supervisors at some point in the near future. Um, and in that document, they identify this site as the preferred site for this maintenance and service facility. They also identify uh, a backup option just as they would for uh, other projects. They have ad identified a site in Paramount. Uh, the difference in cost of that site, I think, was a prohibiting factor for them, as well as some of the logistics of the project necessary to make that site work. Certainly, this site was their, prefer their preferred um, their preferred location. Having said that, uh, the city council was, in my opinion, fairly specific in the conditions under which it could consent to the sale and conversion of this property. Uh, in this particular instance, the city owns this property. It's not a private property. Um, and if Metro wants to use it for this purpose, they either require your approval to do so in the, the context of a sale, um, or they would require eminent domain to go forth and do that, uh, it, which they have the option to do if they so choose. Having said that, I think it's important for us as the city to consider all of our long-term options. And I think that's the conversation we're really having. It's not necessarily about um, transportation or housing or any one particular issue. It's we have a, a site in our community that's a large open space opportunity for for our community in the future and what is the best future land use on that site? What is the priority of our community and what is the priority of our state to, to build on that site? And I don't have an answer for you that in that, but that's the process that we'd be looking at starting here. Now the eminent domain factor is always there and that could be extra, although at this point in time, we have never had negotiations at all other than to say, your site in Bellflower is to our advantage to acquire. But that's about as far as the conversation has gone. There's been no formal negotiations with Metro. There's been some discussions with us and with uh, HSP, whose representatives are here this evening, by the way, um, with them as well, about what it might look like in the future. But there's been no specific negotiations with Metro as to what this could look like. In fact, I think Metro has effectively asked cities along the line to commit to projects, commit to long-term financing for projects without any real specifics as to what the cost of that financing might be. Uh, and that's a difficult position to, to be in. Having said that, I think in the 
coming months, we would expect that Metro would begin the process of those negotiations and start those conversations with us, but it's difficult to commit to one thing or another until you can actually see the meat and potatoes of the product, so. No, and uh, case in point, I think the public should know that a 3% responsibility of the city of Bellflower, and there will be true all the cities along the line, starting in Artesia and going all the way up to Union Station, all have an involvement of 3%, which is expected for their contribution to the line, and our contribution would build a $40 million train station on Belfar Boulevard. Is that right? That is correct, except there has been some conversations with Metro in the past um, that that 3% applied to all cities along the line. There's been some changes to that, and it, the 3% applies to cities where there's a station proposed to be built. So that 3% number has increased over time as well. So again, we don't know what that 3% number is, and Metro hasn't given us a solid number as to what that 3% is. Because they don't know what it's going to cost to build the project. Correct. Um, and it's worth noting that they are billions with a B short on the funding for this project as well, but they will be seeking federal funding and external funding as well. But I think, to your point, the City Council was pretty specific in laying out those conditions ahead of time that uh, the purchase price is sufficient to, is based on market rate for the property and sufficient to offset uh, open space opportunities in the community, that the establishment of the rail facility in and of itself was would be sufficient to offset the city's 3%. Those are the conditions that the council said it would consent to the sale and, and uh, conversion of this property. Okay. All right, so we have no more questions, staff. I'm looking for a motion to open the public hearing. I think it's an item, consi it's an item uh, consideration. consideration. Yeah. All right, so uh, we don't need that public, but I would invite the public to come forward Dennis, yeah. Geo, I'm sure yeah. you've got questions. I'll try to. You may as well hear from him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I wanted to kind of lay out the track a little bit here for you. Well, so the track. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you know what we know, and uh, you can learn from that. No, no pun intended. Hello, uh, Dennis. Well, actually, hello. I haven't seen you guys in a long yeah. time. Welcome back. Hello, nice to see you, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be back. All right. So I just want to use this time to uh, present our opposition to your proposal to do, uh, change the zoning on this. And as you I know you briefed over our lease, just very brief, we actually been there about almost 24 years. And on our lease, we do have 30, about 31 more years uh, left. We have about 31 years left on our lease, right? And uh, I heard a couple times, you were you so many of the, your council used word taking. I think Victor might have used taking too. So you know our concern is when you hear, when you start seeing this, we have 31 years. It's it'll be a moot point in 31 years <laughs> if you you do this. They won't need housing here like this. So they're doing right now. And you say on your thing that every, citizens are impacted by the cost of, of high affordable housing. Well, that's pretty much almost all of California. I would think every city, almost every city in California would say their number one concern is we don't have affordable housing. That's a California issue. It's not a city issue. So I just want to let you know that. And uh, it's really, I'm really concerned when you, when you use the word taking. You know, like we have 31 years. So, so what, is, what is the end goal? So the end goal is get it rezoned, and then you know what? Let's default them. Let's default the lease, get them out, so we could build housing. That's our concern. You you say no. This has happened before with this with the city. It's happened before. And if you're doing all this now, it's not for 31 years from now. It's for pretty much very close to like one or two years from now. Maybe not even one year. That is a grave concern of ours. We have mouths to feed. We have all these employees. We have a, we have a lot going on. We've been very nice to the city. That is an extreme concern of ours. And I'm going to let Gio talk now. He's, he likes to talk a lot more than I do. <laughs> but I just want to let you know. And oh, another issue, too. MTA has issued their final EIR. The final EIR is out. And that impacts the site, too. So maybe you should maybe you should look into that before you guys make a decision. 
<coughs> Go ahead, Gio. All right, guys, so here's my concern. One, I was out of town. We had a big family event in Santa Barbara. I had to leave to come here. I believe that I've always been a great business operator for the city. During COVID, no one paid, we paid. We didn't fire no employee, every employee got a paycheck. Not only we did that, the extra money we had in the bank, we fed thousands of people, residents, because that's how we operate. We're always one for the community. And I'm always say, I always say this, I want to do whatever's in the best interest of Bellflower and ourselves. We are happy to be here. You guys were not all here when we started in 1999. In 1999. Now, what concerns me, it's a major concern. And you know I'm a nice guy, but I am also could be the opposite. Because I always like to be fair. Years ago, there was a guy sitting in your chair named Mike Ian. He came to rezone. Three weeks, four weeks later, they tried to default my lease because there's a piece of plywood on the floor and they said the park was dirty and filthy. This is our concern. It's not the first time. What do we have to do? Spend thousands of dollars, get good attorneys. They had to go to your warehouses and take boxes out to, to find notice that the city was having all sorts of weird conversations on the internet. We had the option to go public with this. We did not because we believe we are one with the city of Bellflower. We didn't want a scandal. What concerns me is even the topic. There's nothing going on. They released the ERR. You guys know I didn't want this, guys. They released it at 407 today. There's a, the things impacted. Metro spent millions of dollars. I don't want to be part of no lawsuit. I don't want to be part of another city of Bell situation. This is weird. You guys know what to call me. Somebody should say, hey, Gio, we're going to do this. Let's sit down. No, what I have to hear, starting today at 10 o'clock, at least 80 phone calls. Gio, what's going on? We have 100 employees over there. We do over 200,000 customers. About 30,000 customers are influencers. We represent something like 600 million um, aspect of influence through our influencers. 600 million people like that. What the hell's going on here? We, I sat with you guys. I'm always open-minded for whatever, but I don't like to get blindsided. This was a major blindsided because I didn't know about it. I started getting on the phone, and naturally, we have good people that I've talked to, and hey, Gio, it's not a big deal. We're just trying to do this. I understand that, and I want the best for the city of Bellflower. We don't take everything. We have our schools, our public schools and private schools always hitting us up for, for money and stuff. We do our best to do that. We have... Other communities, they need help, food, toys, whatever. We do that. I'm always open-minded, but I don't like to get blindsided. And I don't like to hear in a public forum, no one knows what the hell's going on. There's an ARR here. I didn't want to go to these meetings. I've been going to meetings for 10 years. And all I ask for, if that's got to happen, City of Bellflower, just give me another location to put my business, because I have a viable business. People around the world want my business. When COVID hit, we made more money. When the economy went back in 2007, we made money. Get Tay. Bring Tay over here. We're one of your top producers of revenue. To be treated like this is rough. And I want everybody here to know this and know it now publicly. I will not take this lightly. You want to see thousands of people out there? Piss me off. Because I am open-minded. This business represents hundreds of families that need to make the income there. Not to mention we have 30-something years left. I don't want to go anywhere. You guys came to me about Metro 10 years ago. But I said, OK, you guys want to do that? Give me another location. All I'm saying, I understand where you guys are coming from. But are we friends? If we're friends, that's one thing. Then let's be friends. But if we're going to be scoundrel, then that's a different situation. And I'm going to fight. And I'm going to fight hard. And this will be a national news. In one second, today, I could have pushed a button and have thousands of people right there. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. When COVID hit, we pushed a button, and we got tens of thousands of pounds of food to get out to the community. Some of you guys up there helped me do that. When Schwarzenegger wanted to run for governor, where did he come? He came to Bellflower. He didn't come anywhere else. A lot of you guys were just, at the time, just business owners. 
I said, I'm going to get Schwarzenegger here. He's going to announce running for governor here. And he did. Because Bellflower is a beautiful community. We had a beautiful business. Because our business really hits veterans, families, and it's a very fun way for a family to go out and mingle with each other. You guys know that. I don't have to explain what we do there. We're very quiet. Business over there in the corner, generating all sorts of money. You guys take 6% of my gross sales, which is a gigantic number based on taxes. I just don't understand this, guys. I love you guys. I love the city of Bellflower. I respect you guys with all my heart. But when I feel like, like, what just happened here? Why couldn't I be notified? It's not a big deal. This is not a big deal. Hey, guys, we're going to do this. Let me prepare my staff. You guys would want the same. Suppose that today you say, oh, we're going we're gonna to take that sign down. And your staff doesn't know. They could say, oh, we're not going to be the city that grows together. We're going to be the city that does not grow together. Guys, we're adults here. This is the weirdest shit I've ever seen in my life. We've been having conversations. We've been having conversations that I didn't want to be a part of. Ten years ago when this happened, what happened? I was gonna. I came here pissed. Ray, you were here during that time. I didn't want it. You came to me. Hey, look what we're doing. You guys been doing this behind my back? Any other place, if this was the Wild West, believe me, it wouldn't be happening. I've been a good business owner in this town. And I feel very disrespected. And I don't know if I can trust you guys anymore. So you want me to be the biggest pain in the ass? I will get 1,000 people at that damn door. This is ridiculous. For me to leave a family event and come here, when it could have been just a phone call, it's rude. That's it. I leave you guys with this. Whatever you guys do, do. If we were to be friends, I want to be friends. I love this town. This town has blessed my family, has blessed Dennis' family, has blessed 200 employees over there. Any weekend you go to that place, you have Will Smith, Nicholas Cage, you have celebrities there, real celebrities. When developers come into this town, Starbucks, Target, Olds, they all come see us first and say, what if, what's going on in this town? How do you have this? We have major celebrities at this place every weekend. And not one time we get invited to a city state award. We're just left there. Forget you guys. But we bring in cash. And we bring in good community marketing. I hope this was an oversight, not done purposely. I love each and one of you guys. You're new. I'm sorry to get mad at you. Your first time <laughs> uh, with me. I, after two years, they, 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 you, people are not used to this. But we need to have better communication. You guys decide what you want to do. But I think this, what you guys are doing here today, and saying that we don't know what's going on, Metro is a billion-dollar agency. It's federal. Don't become the city of Bell. We are the beautiful, the city of Bellflower. We are a real community of neighbors caring for neighbors, businessmen caring for businessmen. Like you guys. You guys try to pass some things to help business people. We're all in it together, guys. Communication is the best way for not having disgruntled neighbors. You don't wonder why up and down there's complaint. Bellflower, we were all open-minded, and we communicate with each other. Even this document, you're saying that Dante's property and a house down the street has nothing to do with Hollywood sports. Even the address is wrong. How do we put notification out there? The addresses are wrong. Look, get on your phone. Look at the address you guys put. There's a house on the street and then the, the, the oil yard in front of us. Saying that's Hollywood sports? Come on, guys. You know where it's at. It's right there, 903076. I love you. I'm a little upset, a little perturbed, but I, I love you guys. And I just hope this is oversight. Mayor, can I say something? Yeah. Gio, Gio. Gio, don't go away mad. <laughs> I want to say, say something. something. Yeah. <laughs> so the last 10 years, or even better than that, with the MTA, have you always entertained the idea someday the MTA will take over that property and buy your lease out? No. No. Never I said that. I said, give me a new location. That's my impression. That's give me a new location. I, and that's what I never, ever heard about. that from you. Yeah. Yes, always. Yeah, I never heard always. that. Always. Yeah. But I heard that, you know, that the, me, I took it as, 
is um, someday the MTA would buy you out and you have a payday, which is fine. All right, if, that, the MTA, that, if the MTA buys you out, but that, that's that's not, my not even, impression. But Ray, not even the MTA of, told of us doing that. talking to you. Yeah, for but a the decade. MTA never told us that. What the MTA says, they would relocate you. Now, it may, okay, they're going to relocate. If you, you want to have a discussion about the MTA, then maybe put it on the calendar and we'll discuss it. Hmm. Right now, there's about you guys rezoning Hollywood Sports uh, site and taking the site. Or the, yes, it is about taking not, the site. We're and not we're, taking the site. So you, we can take the site in thirty-two <laughs> yeah. in thirty-one yeah. years. Yeah. No, you're not. You're gonna you plan on doing that now. But that it, that's how it's coming off, guys. Because you guys did it before. This city council. There's nothing in, in the document you've been holding up that I, says we're gonna take Ray, it. Ray, on history, three times in twenty years. When we first got the place, we got a lawsuit. We won, right? Then I don't know, before, I don't know nothing about yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. That happened. Then Mike tried to rezone it. And change their things around. And then I don't know nothing about that. We won that too. But every time you guys try to do something, all of a sudden we get a default letter. And the last default letter that cost us a couple hundred thousand dollars and cost you guys money too was because they're going to default the lease. Take my lease because they said the park was dirty. It was pretty shabby. I was on. Okay. There. I it, saw it. <laughs> it, but, was, it was pretty shabby. But shabby to what? <laughs> shabby to what, Ray? Shabby that the, the most. The most influential people in LA County goes there. Have you well, walked no, around? I, but have you I, been I around the town? Around lady. Oh, you're talking about a decade ago. Yeah, I understand I that. You, but you what sure I'm you saying want to hear is, this tonight, here? Yeah, but you're <laughs> the one to bring it up. Okay. Yes, the paintball fields look like paintball field. What but that park is beautiful. What about the movies getting filmed there? Huh? What about the movie weekend there? That your staff approved the permit. <laughs> we we didn't do that. You took it out of our hands. You want to go there? I'm doing it. You want to do field permits because people want to go there. We want all people to go there. I don't think that's what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> then, I'm going to be honest. Okay. Then your staff approved the permit, mm -hmm. and then they filmed an adult movie or tried to film an adult movie there. Your staff approved it. So let's go there. This has been the history. If we don't watch our butts back there, stuff hits the fan. I don't want this to be a public mm -hmm. like this. This town always seems me happy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be upset. I don't want to be upset. I want well, you to be fair with me. That's all well, I'm saying. I, know. I, I was under the impression that you were looking for a payday. No. And that's I'm what you came across me that from all the talks over the last 10 years. Yeah. Yes. I'm wrong then. You're saying I'm wrong. L l I'm saying that. Well, it's the same thing. That's what eminent domain does. I, I We're, we have no intention to eminent domain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's what that's what eminent domain does. So, if the MTA was going to eminent domain you, that's what they do. That's the law to make someone whole. Relocation, buying out the lease, all that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I see your point. I believe that, yeah.
It's all right. I'm good. Yep. No, I get it. But this is this is a document that we're going to proceed with some EIRs and and do some investigation for housing on that property. It's just information for us right now. Well, yes, but that could morph into something else. I, I can see why you're upset. Yeah. No, I'll give you that. You will get notified for if there's a public hearing for sure because then everybody's notified then. This is just an inter, 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 you know, this is just an item of consideration to, for us to start dialogue. But I think the basis for you up, being upset is you reading into this that we're not going to continue to operate with you as a tenant for 31 more years. That's not our intent. Well, that's a different council. That's not us. No, I understand where your concern is, but we expect you to come in in October and sign the lease for the extension that you're looking for, and we have no qualms about that. We don't. No, no, but that's what we we want you to operate. And like you said, you're a good sales tax. If we got an empty lot there, we get nothing. I mean, the money you bring in is really significant, and I don't want you to lay off 200 people. I want you to operate there 30 more years. Now, will Metro come along before that? I don't know. We, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we've heard uh, all kinds of dates on that stuff. Metro says uh, on their paperwork, like, 2036. We'll all I mean, be in Rose Hills that by then. That could be extended to 2046. <laughs> Who knows? No. It's pine this guy, nonsense. <laughs> With your health and my health, where, where are we going to be in 2036? I'm here, Dan. All right. I'm, here. Yeah. I'm not leaving. <laughs> right. But... I don't want you to read into this thing. This We blindsided you in a way to think that we were going to eliminate you from being a part of Bellflower. That's not our intent. And that's why I'm upset. No, and I get that. And if we fell down on the job, it was that you didn't get a phone call or a notice before this morning when you called me. But I don't want you to think that in any way, shape, or form, we don't want you operating there. And we, we don't know what Metro's going to do. You've heard the reasons why we want to rezone it. It's yeah. because the, the, the state of California has got our tentacles in us and said, you've got open space. You need to zone it accordingly. Now, you can operate there. It's you're not conformity, but that's okay. You're still operating. Everything's the same. You right. come in here. You'll get your 31 years. You're not going to lay anybody off. Uh, you don't have to pick up the plywood. You make the park as nice as you want to be. But we're not here to take you out of business. That's not our intent. That never came up. It's simply to figure out with the state. Of, we've got two th antagonistic things here. And Metro's not pleased with this either, by the way, because they wrote an EIR, and all of a sudden we said, well, you guys never even made us an offer on the property. That's right. No, we have – you say you want it, but everybody wants 22 acres, you know. Right, right. And you and I have talked about building things on there 10 years ago. That's right. And so you know that has always been a possibility. Yeah. As long as you can stay there and, and replace the place that – Replace what you have so you continue to operate. Correct. That's your biggest deal. Exactly. You and I have discussions what happened to Chino. Uh, you moved over 100 yards, and you're back in business. That's right. In a perfect world, that's what you could do here in Bellflower. That's right. But that's I don't want you to, to think that any way, shape, or form that your lease and you operating here has any impact on what we're doing with the zone. The zone will be maybe different. We've got to go through the process. We're going to do EIR, but I, in the long term of it all, in my heart of hearts, I think Metro is going to come to the party and says, okay, we still need that thing because to go to Paramount's $200 million more because we've got to buy property, we got to pay uh, businesses, got to be bought out at the swap meet. There's all kinds of tentacles on right, that deal. Right. I understand that. Don't no, but the only thing that I believe that will put you out of business in my heart of hearts is if Metro comes along and says, it's time. We're going to have to do something uh, and put a, a, a yard in here for maintenance of the trains. And, and in that case, I've even heard, and I don't know if this is right, they might even want your property at the beginning of the project, not at the end, because they use that at a construction place to, to put the rest of the metro together. And you've heard that too. Yeah, that's, that's no right. mystery. They might put a ready mix plant on there. Who's to know? That's right. But it, irregardless, you have, like you said, 31 more years to operate there. And we as a city are operating on the premise that you're going to be here 31 more years. That's either all as, I want, Dan. Either That's as it. you as the owner or as <laughs> your previous guy, <laughs> and Dennis is going to be there to back you up. But I, if you ask any one of these councilmen, have we ever had any thoughts about, hey, this is a way that we can screw Gio and Dennis? That's not our intent. Okay, Dan, it's I try to make sure that the city 
gets the best advantage out of that property. And it's true. Metro's over here, state of California is over here, and we're somewhere in the middle. Yeah. All right, Dan. So I apologize to counsel for getting No, upset. but you don't need to threaten us with a no. thousand people in here. I know you can do it, and I don't <laughs> want it, but I want to put the genie back in the bottle. All right. I All think right. Dennis and uh, city uh, attorney are going to have uh, city clerk, uh, clerk. The city manager, I busted him three notches already. Uh, <laughs> no, no, anyway. <laughs> Captain Crunch over here. But anyway, uh, Dennis, I think it's coming in on Wednesday. We're going to have a meeting. Yeah. And if you're welcome yeah. to come as well. But I'm, I'm going to do my best to be part of that meeting. I want to try to get the genie back in the bottle best we right. can. So I but, just... Publicly, but I, say, I will apologize. I apologize for getting upset. No, but this I, just threw I, me off. That's no, it. but there's an apology made. I will do it on the city of Bellflower side. You should have been notified before this, the genie came out of the bottle. But we're going to put it back in the bottle. You operate. You you promote. Have your 3,500 people there at $100 each. God bless you. Everything's cool. All right. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right, where were we? Oh, and more public comments. <laughs> anybody yeah, else? Anybody got? else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, third time's a charm. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. In 1992, when I came back to Bellflower for the second time, this was not a destination city. We'd lost a lot of stuff over the years. The theater was closed. Car dealerships were gone, and we didn't have much. The golf course didn't make it, but then, lo and behold, here comes Hollywood sports. And I heard about the actors and coming to Bellflower and spending some time at the paintball park, and I said, holy smokes, we are starting to become a destination city. And since then, we get Steelcraft, stand-up comedy, and other places that have made Bellflower a destination city. We've got Calaveras going. We've got other restaurants going, sidewalk, uh, people eating out on the sidewalk. You've got <clears throat> the old Johnny Rebs being converted now to a Mariscos uh, restaurant. You've got Roca restaurant going on. And... I would hate to see us lose the key place that got Bellflower back on the map. But progress is progress. But if that ever changes and something happens to Hollywood sports, I think we've got to do our best to try to find a spot in Bellflower for him or them to move, to relocate, reestablish, and continue to provide revenue for the city of Bellflower. And I thank you very much for listening to me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to offer? Gio, anything else? I never give anybody a second crack at the apple, but uh, I know you well enough that I know you. you, you <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, if I might. Yes. It's worth noting in these conditions, the last condition here that the city council added in 2018 to this resolution, it actually says in order for the city to consent to the sale and conversion of this property for Metro's purposes, they're responsible for relocation of their tenant as necessary. So the city council at that time felt it important enough something to include because of the partnership with Hollywood Sports Park, to include as a condition of the actual sale of the property. So right. it's worth knowing that. And yeah. Metro has been presented this right. list of requirements. So everything's cool with trying to protect you best we can. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, yes. um, the city uh, manager did highlight in doing what we're doing would add additional protection to the uh, current tenant right. as well. Right. That was something that he highlighted earlier in his presentation. Right. Um, and that's why I wanted to put that up there. So you guys knew that we weren't just letting you spin in the wind, that there is protection there for you, and that Metro knows these things. Before we change are working on changing the zone, they knew of these items, and they still came to the party. And they wrote an EIR that included that property as part of the EIR. So I really believe when it's all said and done, we're still back where we were before. We're just in a different zone area. That's all.
and that's because the state of California has got requirements that we've got to adhere to. Nobody else has 22 acres in the middle of their town. I don't, you know, go to Downey, go to Lakewood, go to, and nobody has that. And so uh, we felt as though the state of California, or the, or the California came to us and said, you know, this has to be zoned appropriately to, for the long term. But it was nowhere has then ever been discussed on any level of city government that you would not get your lease renewed and that you wouldn't be there to operate as long as you can. That has never been a, sec a part of what our discussion is. We just assumed you'll be in here in October and say, sign on the dotted line, we're ready to go for 30 more years. That, we're working on that premise. And, and we'll honor that. And we're not going over there and picking up plywood. Okay? So, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, one more thing I'd like to clarify. Sure. Uh, the use of word taking, uh, I want to make sure that that wasn't taken in the sense of a physical taking. It was the taking of the, uh, from a zoning standpoint and rezoning it towards the arena numbers. It's not the taking of the physical property. So I do want to clarify that because I heard that was uh, something that Dennis said and uh, tried to use as a word. So I apologize for the, um, I could probably use a better word, but it's definitely no uh, physical taking of the property and utilizing it in a different manner. So I just want to clarify that. And look at it this way too, Gio. If you were not to come in next October and sign for another 31 years, for whatever reason, you say, you know, my health won't permit it. I've opened three more parks in other areas. They're making more money. I don't want to play. The city would be hurt more than you if you don't reapply because you're the guy. What do we do with 22 acres? You know, we couldn't turn it back into a golf course. Nobody's going to do that. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with 22 acres? It just become another homeless camp. I don't know what else we do with it. You're important to us to maintain and continue to operate on that property because we have another options for it. And Metro is in the driver's seat when they want to be, but we'll see what happens. So we've had a lot of discussion on this. Um, uh, we, we didn't open a public hearing, so we don't have to close one, but I'm looking for a motion as to where we want to go with putting in motion uh, some uh, possible actions on environmental impact on this property. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to make a motion for the city council to authorize the city manager to release the notice of preparation and execute a task order with DUDEC for preparation of a program environmental impact report. Second. All right, so we have a second by council member Sonny Sanchez, uh, no, supported I mean, first, no, I first by him, excuse me. <laughs> been all night I've been I'm sorry <laughs> We're not you know okay. you're doing used all. to work in this late <laughs> <laughs> but Dutton usually makes the first thank you you know <laughs> we tried to mix it up somehow. right and the second is so we have the first by council member Sonny Sanchez supported by Count Mayor Pro Tem Ray Dutton please poll the council council member Sanchez aye council member Santanez aye mayor Pro Tem Dutton aye council member Morse aye mayor Coops aye Okay, moving on. Consent calendar. Does anyone have any conflicts or any on the consent calendar items? I'm sure we or do. Or is there anything you want to pull? 14C <laughs> and 14H. I have a conflict. One is my employer. Actually, both are my employer. I'll say Wendy's out on C. C and H. And H. That's Wendy. We used to have a trucking company that was called C and H. <laughs> Stood for cold and hungry, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Mayor, I need to recuse myself on 14C. Okay. Dutton's out on 14C because he owns property next to a paved street. <laughs> The three of us apparently do. Right, and so do I. I'm also out on 14C. I'm not conflicted, though. No, and Wendy is out on 14C. And so we're going to draw lots for that. Uh, then, Mr. Mayor, if we can pull item 14E, please. 14E for discussion by Victor. Well, that means there's two councilmen who must live on a dirt road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sonny, have you anything to offer? You uh, Mr. Conflicts? Mayor, uh, I have to recuse. My, oh, no, no, no. It's not <laughs> recuse. I want to pull item D and E. That's good. D 
D and E is for Sonny to discuss. Did you say Victor? E. So you, we're going to have a dis both of you want discussions on E. All right. So uh, whenever you're ready to do the lots, then we'll proceed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, we are prepared to draw lots for item 14C, which three council members are conflicted on. Um, we'll put the names in the glass jar. Here is Mr. Dutton. Beautiful printing. And Mayor Coops. There I am. Ooh. Oh, let me see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Question Mark over Trust there. but verify. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Council Member Morris. There you are. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Your name wouldn't fit on the card, so maybe. Okay. Uh, we will draw a yeah, name. Yeah, that was wrong, remember? <laughs> yeah. We'll draw the name that will participate in the item. Uh, Mayor Coops will participate in the matter. Well, lucky me. Wow. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mayor. Okay. <laughs> so I'm in on 14C. All right. So let's uh, talk about uh, D. Who, who do you want to discuss that with or what do you want to talk about? Uh, Larry's here. I just want to make a comment before okay. we vote on this. Um, this is regarding the uh, Bellflower Noon Lions Club um, sponsorship of the car show. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, the Belfort News Lions Club for hosting this event. It's again, uh, Belfort becomes a destination during the car show, and uh, it's something that I really, I personally enjoy. Um, I'm not um, a car collector, but I enjoy visiting these uh, various cars and enjoying the food in the in the uh, on downtown Belfort Boulevard. So again, I want to extend my my gratitude to the Belfort News Lions Club for. Uh, hosting this event, and especially to uh, Mr. Larry Wehage, I just hope and pray that uh, you will get um, a lot more assistance uh, during the car show and the few days before it. All right. So thank you. All right, Victor, you want to do 14E? Sonny was. Okay. All right. Either one. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just on 14E. Um, uh, mayor and uh, I guess a little bit more of a comment here I I, I think that uh, what we're doing is supporting and uh, finding ways to help our, our one of our local businesses um, with their storage space I think it's a creative way of us for us to do that um, I would just say that uh, if we're gonna be having programs like this or we're gonna be doing things like this they should also be available to the other car dealerships in the area um, such as STG Auto Group and so forth, and, and all the other mom and pop uh, uh, car dealerships that currently serve, for the most part, I think they're all within District 4. I think there might be one or two that, I think you have one. Yes. There's some in your district, yeah. But uh, so I just wanna you know bring that to the attention of this council is uh, I if we're gonna be doing things like this, that they're available to the other operators within our community. And not necessarily for today, but just something maybe we bring back in the future. Understand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Mr. You Mayor, I'm going to yes. pull. Me also, I also want to pull 14E. Okay, you got more discussion on that. Yes. Okay. Um, just a different note because when I read the staff report um, over the weekend, I was kind of surprised about the uh, the staff report in itself. And so I, I called Mr. Uh, RC the Madam is smooth about it, uh, because what I really want is to kind of focus on new cars, uh, because um, if we open it up to all dealerships in the city, it's going to be problematic in terms of space available. So I was glad that uh, looking at the license agreement itself, it actually contained the word new car. So it's a limit, there's a limit limitation. Uh, if you look at um, item, uh, item number two, it's for temporarily storing new vehicle inventory. So I'm very pleased with the addition of the word new cars. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Surdy Clerk, do you have all the recorded uh, recusals and the conflict ones? Yes, that's right. All right. 
So uh, looking for a motion to confirm the consent calendar. Move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All right, we have a motion by Council Member Sonny Sandinez, supported by Council Member Victor Sanchez. Please poll the council. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. Council Member Sanchez? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dutton? Aye. Council Member Morse? Aye. Mayor Coops? Aye. Council reports. Wendy, I'm going to start off with you again because you were so enlightened last time about the uh, <laughs> arc walk. Yeah, the arc walk. Um, I, I don't have anything. I can't think right now, anyways. <laughs> uh, well, if something comes up, we'll it's call I'll, on you I'll, again. Uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right, Mr. Dutton. No comments tonight, Mayor. All right, Mr. Sanchez. No comments, Mr. Mayor. Sonny? Yeah, just a quick comment today sure. because uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the uh, solar eclipse. I was at Sims Park uh, this morning at the uh, published height of the, uh, the eclipse and uh, with the appropriate um, viewing glass, I was able to, to see it. Um, so uh, uh, although it was not as, as pretty as the one on the, on the East Coast, but I still uh, seeing the solar eclipse in Bellflower was, uh, uh, was awesome today. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. So we had an interesting meeting tonight, to say the least, a lot of good subject matter. And uh, hopefully everybody's leaving here somewhat happy. I tried to put the genie back in the bottle for uh, Giovanni and Dennis. We'll see how successful. If we have a thousand people out here at the next meeting, we'll know <laughs> I, I wasn't yeah, I successful. <laughs> so. But thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. And we're going to adjourn this meeting now at uh, five minutes to ten to our next Bellflower City Council meeting, 5:30 p.m. Monday, April 22nd, 2024. We're adjourned. Oh,